Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the YSIC Oral Advocacy Workshop 2017. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Pranam Mago. I'm head South Asia for Singapore International Arbitration Center, and I will be your host for this evening. Before we begin, I would request you all to kindly turn off your mobile phone and other electronic devices or turn them to silent mode. Also, you would have seen some feedback forms lying on your uh, chairs. I would request you to please fill them later and uh, deposit them at the registration desk. Today's Young SEAC Advocacy Workshop is on emergency arbitration under the SIEC rules 2016. We are very pleased and honored to have with us today leading practitioners from multiple jurisdictions who would be engaging in a very interesting and lively rounds of oral argument. First, I would like to invite Mr. Kevin Nash, Center Director and Deputy Registrar of SIAC, to give us his welcome address. Kevin. Thanks, Pranav. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, for being here today. Uh, we have a full room at 6 p.m. on a Friday. I know that it is a court day. Uh, everyone coming in from work. So this is a wonderful turnout. So thank you very much to everyone for being here. Uh, for many of you that, or hopefully few of you that were not at the conferences yesterday, so we had uh, uh, great attendance at that conference and then culminated by a hard talk in the evening. Today is going to get uh, a bit more interesting and hopefully a bit more fun. We ran this event in Mumbai last year to great success uh, with leading advocates, leading arbitrators, uh, and really this case is an amalgam of some of the most interesting issues that we've seen at SIC. Uh, yesterday was about looking to the future, and I'll just back up a bit to the past for a second uh, and just sort of tell you about some of the activities that have been ha happening at SIC. So 2016, another great year for SIC. We had a record number of cases filed, 343 cases filed, 307 of those were administered cases. 2017, uh, as the President, Mr. Gary Bourne, said last night, is looking even better. Uh, so we're looking to exceed that mark uh, this year as well. Turning to this issue, we continue to see a lot of activity on emergency arbitration. We're currently dealing with an emergency arbitration right now uh, back at the Secretariat in Singapore. So this is 69 applications for uh, urgent interim relief that we've received at SIC, which I think is probably more than any other institution in the world. India parties, of course, are a huge factor to SIC's success. We had 156 Indian parties uh, that brought their disputes to SIC in 2016. We are hoping to exceed that mark again in 2017. And I guess as evidenced by the turnout, uh, uh, you can see uh, what a big factor uh, India is for SIC. Just some quick notes on YSIC. YSIC was rebranded a few years ago, and now it's become, become one of the biggest uh, programs for young arbitrators and young advocates in the world. I have just gotten the most recent data, and there are now 2,091 uh, YSIC members. These members come from 95 juris jurisdictions, and is, as is often the case with SIC, uh, the most members are from India. Uh, we have 530 YSIC members from India, so really quite incredible numbers. Uh, I am now going to pass it, this to uh, Rishabh Gupta, member of the YSIC committee. He is going to introduce the case and, and give an overview and concept of the workshop. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you to our sponsors and we hope that everyone will uh, stay for the networking drinks as well. Thank you. Apparently, I didn't fully satisfy my five minutes of time, uh, so I'm going to have to sub in here and just explain, explain the concept. So what we're looking at here is we have 
uh, jurisdictional uh, objection, an objection to jurisdiction before an emergency arbitrator, and then we have the application for urgent interim relief proper. I guess as a starting point, I would say uh, we have a four-headed uh, emergency arbitrator, but this is uh, really uh, four parts making uh, one singular. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to put it to the test to see if uh, parties could agree on a four-member emergency arbitrator. So this is just to get uh, more, f more feedback and more activity to the council. Um, like I said, this is an amalgam of a lot of the things that we see at, at SIC, like it, or 69 applications for immediate uh, or urgent interim relief. Uh, and I think what's important when you're looking at what the council have done and what we see in SIC arbitrations, because these timelines move so quickly, so you might have uh, a claimant makes an application for urgent relief on Friday night. Uh, the president, if he decides to accept the application, uh, we might some appoint an emergency arbitrator in as few as three or four hours sometimes. Emergency arbitrator gets up and appointed on Saturday. There could be a preliminary meeting uh, schedules uh, or uh, hears from the parties. Could be a preliminary order on Sunday. Uh, then there's a hearing on Thursday and then maybe the emergency order on Friday. So all these timelines move very quickly, certainly put counsel to the test. Uh, so we do have a panel of some of the most eminent arbitrators in the world as well as leading uh, counsel from multiple jurisdictions. Uh, so I guess with that, uh, <laughs> or we can uh, perhaps some, have some f further elucidation on the issue uh, as well. Hi everyone, I'm really sorry for this. Um, I was told that yesterday's conference started quite late, so I took the luxury of actually stepping out, uh, assuming that this would also start half an hour late. Apologies for that. My name is Rishabh Gupta, um, and my job here is actually the simplest one, which is to just introduce the problem. So I'll directly dive into that. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't know if the arbitrators and the council have been introduced already, but I'm assuming there's no need for that. And even if I try to do it, they're so accomplished that I'll consume all of my 10 minutes. So I won't even try that. I'll just directly go into the problem. So what have we got here? What we've got here are basically three parties. Uh, we've got Pipe Limited, which is an Indian company. You've got the second respondent, a US company called Chesapeake. And you've got a fully owned subsidiary of that US company called Petrogulf, which is incorporated in the UAE. Now sometime in 2013, uh, uh, Petrogulf and Pipe, the claimant and the first respondent in these proceedings, decided to enter into a joint venture agreement. That joint venture agreement was solely for the purposes of bidding for uh, an LNG pipeline construction project on behalf of the project had to be built on behalf of a company called Raffles Gas, which is a company owned uh, completely by an oil and gas company will completely buy a country called Maxwell. Well, no, I guess, prizes for guessing where that word came from. Um, and the JBA uh, has, uh, a jo has a dispute resolution clause and a governing law clause. Now, I'm assuming all of you have read that because that forms the basis of the proceedings today. But there are five things to remember about it. First, it contains a negotiation period, whether mandatory or not, that would be discussed by the council, but a 60-day negotiation period followed by a 30-day notice period. Second, it provides for disputes to be submitted to an institute called the Singapore Chamber of Commerce, not to be confused with SIAC. Third, it provides for arbitrations at Singapore, so the seat is Singapore. It contains a governing law clause for the matrix contract, not for the arbitration agreement, and that uh, governing law clause is for India. So Indian law is the law of the governing law clause, and the fifth thing that obviously follows from it is that the contract doesn't provide for the law of the arbitration agreement, which of course, uh, as the evening progresses, would become more and more relevant. Uh, now, after the JVA was signed, uh, a bid was submitted to Raffles Gas and that bid was accepted on behalf of the consortium, which led to the conclusion of what is described as the Raffles contract in 2013. Now, as pursuant to that contract, as security, a performance bond had to be given. Now, that performance bond wasn't given by any of the parties to the JVA or to the consortium. It was rather given by the parent company, 
uh, which I mentioned was Chesapeake, the second respondent here. So performance bond of $20 million. And what happened along with that was that there was a bank guarantee which the Indian company, Pipe Limited, gave in favor of both the first respondent and the second respondent, Chesapeake, as well as Petrogas. Uh, now, as it happens in such cases, disputes arose between the parties, and sometime in August 2017, uh, a termination notice was issued by, by Rapids Gas, which, led, which at least it attempted to terminate the contract. Uh, and it also called upon the performance bond, the 20 million performance bond that I mentioned. Uh, that performance bond was paid out, but subsequently what Petrogulf tried to do is it tried to call upon the bank guarantee that Pipe had given. Now, the bank that had issued the bank guarantee basically did not uh, accept it on the grounds, did not accept the request on the grounds that the notice period under the bank guarantee hadn't been met with. Uh, and simultaneously, Pipe also refused to pay up. There were meetings between the parties to try and find an amicable resolution. No amicable resolution could be reached. So finally, on 6 September 2017, uh, Pipe issued a notice of dispute. There were further negotiations between the parties, meetings to reach an amicable resolution. None of it bore fruit. And finally, on 6 October 2017, a notice of arbitration was issued under the SEAC rules. So see as they apply at the moment, SEAC 2016. And simultaneously, there was also an emergency application, which is the application that they're considering now. Now, in that application, two separate orders were sought. Uh, one was an order for provisional relief or immediate relief until the conclusion of the emergency proceedings itself. And that order basically asked for restraint against the bank guarantee from being issued uh, or being uh, encashed until the emergency proceedings are concluded. So that's just a provisional order. And the main order that was sought is that no such uh, bank guarantees should be encashed upon until the final award is issued. Uh, on 7th October 2017, SEAC being SEAC, uh, very efficient. Within a day, emergency arbitrator is appointed. It's a four-headed tribunal here, not a single arbitrator as you normally find in these proceedings. On 8th October 2017, the emergency arbitrator held a telephonic conference uh, in which basically he issued the provisional order as well as set out a schedule for the remaining proceedings. Subsequently, there were uh, f filings made by both sides, by the respondents as well as the claimant. Um, and here we are on 13th October 2017 in New Delhi doing the actual hearing. Uh, now, I won't go through uh, the uh, problem, uh, the arguments that are there, but the way it's been uh, distributed is that there are three jurisdictional objections being raised against the emergency arbitrator's jurisdiction, and each of those will be argued separately by a set of uh, counsel for the claimant and for the respondent, heard by the same emergency arbitrator comprising of four arbitrators. And after that, there will be a separate panel, well, the panel will remain the same, but a separate sets of counsel who will be debating or arguing the main application, as well as the ground on which uh, interim relief should be granted. Uh, so with that, I think I'll stop, and apologies once again. Thank you, Rishabh. Let's now begin with the first part, the jurisdictional objections. As Risha pointed out, in a normal emergency arbitrator case, it is one arbitrator, but since it's a very, very complex problem, that's why it requires three heads, with a fourth head on its way. <laughs> As a multi-headed emergency arbitrators, we have Mr. Gary Bond, President, SIAC Court of Arbitration, <laughs> Chair, International Arbitration Practice Group, Wilmer Cutler Pickering, Hale and Door LLP, Mr. Toby Landau, QC, Barrister and Arbitrator of Essex Court Chambers, Member of SIC Court of Arbitration, and Chair of SIC Users Council, United Kingdom. Mr. Siku Mukhopadhyay, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. For the first jurisdictional objection, we are pleased to have Mr. Mozum Khan, Member of YSIAC Committee, Co-Head International Disputes Practice, Nishad Desai Associates, as counsel for the respondent, respondents, and Mr. Sonal Kumar Singh, partner A.K. Singh & Co. as counsel for the claimant. 
I will leave it to the councils to uh, decide if they want to come one by one. Perfect. Let the proceedings begin. So it, it was said that um, it was an eminent tribunal of, of three with, with one coming. In reality, it's because uh, the three of us, each one of us is really worth one third of an arbitrator. Um, and so together we constitute a, a single emergency arbitrator. We're going to do our best in this. Um, the, the reality as well is that Toby, who's sitting in the middle, is the chairman and is going to run this hearing. <laughs> According to this wasn't, this wasn't the agreement. Can I just, 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 to be, just to be clear, in fact, I think we're already having differences within the tribunal. <laughs> the, the role is Gary, who is the most senior amongst us and the most authoritative, obviously, he will be running it. And Siku and I are going to reflect different aspects of Gary's character. <laughs> That's a really difficult task. What we're going to do is we will we'll play this by ear, I think. Um, I, I'll begin, but Siku and Toby will um, exactly. they'll pipe in frequently and, and often, playing the role of me, I guess. <laughs> uh, all right, how do we begin? Who, who, who's, who's claimant? Yeah, so uh, I'm representing the claimant here for the first jurisdictional issue. And can you introduce yourself and, yes, uh, and I'm counsel Sonal, for the respondents to sure. the same? I'm Sonal Kumar Singh, and uh, I'm partner with AK Singh & Co, and I would be representing the uh, claimant in the matter uh, for the first jurisdictional issue. Very well. And for respondents? Uh, my, my name is Mozam, and I'll be representing the respondents. Have you reached an agreement on time? Uh, yes, uh, we have agreed on time. So as total uh, time allotted is 15 minutes, we are going to have seven uh, and a half minutes each. Excellent. The, the seat here is Singapore? Yes, yeah, seat is Singapore. What are we doing in New Delhi? <laughs> so venue, uh, which has been decided, is Delhi. So that is where the tribunal and the parties are here in Delhi. One of the things we need to remember about SIEC arbitrations is you can both seat them anywhere and also have hearings for the convenience of the parties anywhere. So it makes perfect sense in this case that we would be sitting here in Delhi for the convenience of the parties, if not for the tribunal. You can proceed. Uh, so here the first issue which uh, has been raised uh, by the respondent on jurisdiction uh, is with regard to the name of the institution which has been mentioned in the arbitration clause there could not be any doubt that there is some kind of an ambiguity and uncertainty with regard to the name of the institution which is mentioned, uh, which is Singapore Chamber of Commerce. Admittedly, there is no institution uh, named Singapore Chamber of Commerce. So aren't we done? Sorry? Aren't we finished? No, we are not actually. If there's no such institution? I'll just begin, so. Okay. <laughs> but there are certain aspects in the arbitration clause which need to be looked into and which provide Certain, uh, certain aspects which are pretty much certain out of, uh, our, uh, in the arbitration clause. First, we need to see the intention of the parties, that parties intend to resolve their disputes through arbitration. Second thing which is clear from the arbitration clause is that parties intended that their arbitration be administered by an arbitral institution. And the word Singapore, which is uh, used in Singapore Chamber of Commerce, also signifies that parties intended that the arbitral institution is of Singapore or can be identified with Singapore or be associated with Singapore. Fourth, that the rules which parties intended to apply to the arbitration proceedings were of the same institution, that is, of, of Singapore. And of course, as has been mentioned, the seat of arbitration has been agreed between the parties as Singapore. Doesn't the ICC have an office in Singapore? Chamber of Commerce sounds like International Chamber of Commerce to me, no? Yes, they do have, they, they, they do have an administrative office. But the point that I'm trying to bring to the table is that when Singapore is used in the name of the institution, then parties intended that there has to be an institution which can be identified or be associated with, this, with Singapore. So Mr. Example, Singh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt. Yeah. You've got three words here. You've got Singapore, you've got chamber, and you've got commerce. Right. Two of those words are pointing in one direction, ICC. Right. One word is pointing in another direction. Why should we be persuaded by the one word? 
I would like to bring the uh, attention of the tribunal to the general trend and practice which is uh, followed or the general perception that uh, you know the, the parties or the councils have towards the name of the institutions used in different parts of uh, parts of the world for example LCIA London Code of International Arbitration as soon as you uh, hear London Code of International Arbitration you can relate it to London because the word uses London HKIC Hong Kong International Arbitration Center as soon as you hear Hong Kong uh, HKIC, you can associate it with, with, with the jurisdiction, Hong Kong. Similarly, Dubai, Dubai International Arbitration Center. So that is the point that I'm trying to make then when, when the parties are using word Singapore Chamber of Commerce, more significance has to be given to the word Singapore. And that in that background, it has to be seen that which is the institution which actually uh, can be associated as most renowned and known in Singapore which, according to us, is Singapore International Arbitration Center, and not ICC, which is ol only holding an administrative office in Singapore. Are you suggesting that because the parties are from international jurisdictions, if they wanted to use the International Chamber of Commerce, they would have said International Chamber of Commerce and not Singapore. They wouldn't have localized it to Singapore. Is that part of your argument? Uh, yes. That's the role of a co-arbitrator. <laughs> <laughs> the Indian one. <laughs> Please proceed. So uh, my submission is that in the background of certain facts which are pretty much clear from the arbitration clause, it has to be seen that there's only one institution administering arbitration in Singapore which can actually be identified with Singapore, that is Singapore International Arbitration Center. And that is why my submission would be that the plea of the respondent with regard to the first jurisdictional issue that this tribunal does not have jurisdiction uh, should be rejected. Sorry, <clears throat> I'm sorry to interrupt. No, absolutely. I'm not that sorry actually. The, um, I want to put to you, uh, you're, you're saying that we resolve this by saying well there's an institution which is in, has been intended but can't one just read this as pathological, it's a big confusion, the only thing that we can take from this perhaps is an intention to arbitrate and that would lead us to an ad hoc arbitration. Uh, I would say that, yes, of course, there is an intention to arbitrate, but there is also an uh, intention that the arbitration is to be administered by an institution. Because if that was not the intention, then there was no need for mentioning the name of the institution. And in fact, going ahead, parties have also mentioned that, that the rules of that institution would be applicable to, uh, to the arbitration proceedings. So there is a clear intention, of course, to arbitrate, but there's also a clear intention, of course, that the arbitration be administered by an institution and rules of that institution be applicable to, the, to those arbitration proceedings. You have two minutes. So uh, moving ahead, the another point I would like to make, and after that I would, I would conclude my submission, is that even assuming if the tribunal holds that they have jurisdiction and SIAC uh, has the authority to administer the arbitration and the SIAC rules would be applicable, my submission is that no prejudice would the party. Reason being that when parties had agreed for SCC or Singapore Chamber of Commerce, no institution or no such rules ever existed. So it cannot be said that you know, if it was another institution which had better rules or better uh, infrastructure to administer the arbitration, so my submission to conclude would be that in this background, Singapore International Arbitration Center is the only inst institution in Singapore uh, which is available and in the background of the intention of the parties, which is to uh, submit the dispute to arbitration and uh, getting the arbitration dispute administered by an institution, it has to be Singapore International Arbitration Center and governed by Singapore International Arbitration Center rules. In support of uh, my submissions, I've also, uh, I would also like to place reliance on few judgments. Uh, if I may bring the tribunal to judgment of Court of Appeal of Singapore, which is in Sigma Technology Company Limited, Alstone Technology Limited, uh, where the court has discussed the principle of effective interpretation, where the court has stated that where but that case has nothing to do with the issue before us. We're, I think everybody accepts that there's a valid arbitration agreement. The question is 
what kind of agreement is it? Is it an ICC or an SIAC agreement, or is it an ad hoc agreement? This case doesn't help us, does it? Right. Uh, the only purpose of pointing this case out was to uh, rely and bring to the tribunal the principle of eff effective interpretation to which the courts have been following in Singapore. Right, but that just upholds a pathological clause that it enables us to rescue a clause which may have defects. That's not our problem here. We have a clause, and the question is, what does it mean? Uh, I would say that there, there is some un uncertainty attached to the clause, and that is why we are before the tribunal arguing this, uh, this very issue. Uh, but of course, that defect is curable, and that is what I'm trying to show through that judgment, that where the defect is curable, and where the intention of the parties can be ascertained, the closest possible view should be taken by the tribunal to hold, uh, in, in, to, to make the clause, arbitral clause effective. I'd, I'd like to go back, I think you've got 30 seconds, um, but I'd like to go back to the question. You, you, you said that the SIAC is the only institution in Singapore, only arbitral institution in Singapore. Is that right? Aren't there other institutions? There, there, uh, the, there is presence of other institutions, but the point that I'm trying to bring to the table is that there's one institution which actually can be identified with Singapore or which could be uh, known as arbitral institution of Singapore because of its popularity and because of its market share and various other reasons. That's Very well. Point. So far as I know, SIEC, like ICC, is a global arbitral institution, so I'm not sure how far that argument gets you. I think you're out of time, though. Respondents. Thank you. Uh, I believe the tribunal has the bundle that I've circulated. Uh, before I begin my arguments, I just want to, uh, uh, you know, put my point to the tribunal first as to what I would be trying to show to the tribunal. The point that I'll be trying to make is, uh, I believe this felt from uh, Mr. Bond, that this arbitral clause is a pathological clause. What I'd be trying to show is that it is impossible to infer an intention from this clause which is sufficiently coherent to enable an arbitration in CIAC, in SIAC to function. That's the, that's, that'll be my proposition. Yeah, but you now, do accept that there is a clause to arbitrate. Yes, there is, and I, I say it's unworkable. And there's a clear intention to have an institution and a clear intention to have institutional rules. I would say that there is, a, there is an intention to arbitrate. Whether it's clear and to, which intent, and to which institution, there is absolutely no clarity. No, but if you would look at it and ask the question, did these parties want ad hoc or institutional, you'd have to say institutional, wouldn't you? Yes, I would. And then you'd have to say, well, which institution is it most likely to be in Singapore? And, and that, that would is, lead you and to And that the is where the confusion lies, my apologies. What I would show to the tribunal is, that uh, as Mr. Bourne was saying, there is not only one arbitral institution in Singapore. There is not only one arbitral institution with the word Singapore in Singapore. In fact, uh, my learned friend from the claimant side uh, placed a lot of importance on the word Singapore used in the arbitration clause. And from the bundle that is before you, if you just move to the second tab of that bundle, This is the Singapore Institute of Arbitrators. It's in the same building as, as, uh, as SIAC, actually, not that it matters. It is almost four decades old. It was established in 1981. It has its own arbitration rules. If you move to tab one, Now this is another institute, it's Singapore International Chamber of Commerce. So this is actually an institute which has all the three words which are used in the clause. Does it have an arbitration service? It does not. So that doesn't help us, does it? It doesn't help us, but what it shows us Thank is, you. sorry, what it shows us is that if at all this is what the parties were intending, if this is the institute that the parties were intending to, uh, which will administer their arbitration, then this clause becomes void ab initio. I thought you accepted that there was an arbitration clause. Parties did agree to arbitrate. Yep. It can't be void ab initio then. Can you? What I'm trying to say is that if, there is a, if, you, if you have to draw a closest connection to, which, to an institute which is named in the clause, this is an institute which comes the closest. And if, you, and if I will be relying on a judgment of the, of the Singapore High Court to say how 
if this happens, the clause becomes void ab initio. And it, its formal title, if I understand it, is Singapore International Chamber of Commerce. Sorry? <coughs> it, its formal title, if I understand it, is Singapore International Chamber of Commerce. That's right. Is that affiliated with the International Chamber of Commerce? I actually do not know. Hmm. Thank you. Now, now, moving on to the first uh, judgment that I will cite. Uh, you'll find it on uh, on tab four. It's TMT versus uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. You have tab four. I'll just take you uh, take you straight away to para sixty two. Sorry, can I, can I just ask you, what, um, what law do you say applies to the arbitration agreement itself? I believe both the Claimants Council and I agree that because the seat is Singapore, Singapore law will apply. Uh, on page, uh, on para 65, you'll find the arbitration clause which was the subject matter of this arbitration of this particular case. Sorry, Council, I'm completely lost. Where are we? Para 65. Para 65. 65. Thank you. And I'll just read it out. The arbitration clause. Any dispute arising from or relating to these terms or any contract made hereunder shall, unless resolved between us, be referred to arbitration under, arbitral, uh, under arbitration rules of the relevant exchange or any other organization as the relevant exchange may direct. And both parties agree to such agreement not to be unreasonable, withheld, before either of us resort to jurisdiction of the court. And the decision on this starts from para 62 onwards. And I'll just read the relevant portion. Para 63 is a, is a quote from uh, Tommy Lugan Holdings uh, Limited and other versus uh, Silica Investors Limited. In our judgment, a court hearing such a stay application should grant a stay in favor of the arbitration if the applicant is able to establish a prima facie case that A, there is a valid arbitration agreement between the parties to the court proceedings, B, the dispute in the court proceedings or any part thereof falls within the scope of the arbitration, C, the arbitration agreement is not null and void, inoperative or incapable of being performed. What I intend to say is this arbitration agreement is invalid and incapable of being performed because of its connection with SICC. And for that, I'll refer straight away to para 68 and the last three lines of that. And I'll just read that out. Certainly, whether under English law or Singapore law, a party autonomy in selecting arbitration or other dispute resolution mechanisms would be encouraged and supported. But additionally, neither English nor Singapore courts would readily rewrite the agreements entered into between parties, especially in a commercial agreement between commercial entities, which presumably would have been scrutinized by legal advisors. And if there were any slips, despite such scrutiny, the parties would have to live with the consequences. Don't you agree that the problem here was that it specified the rules under which the arbitration was to take place and there wasn't any such rule, right? So, so, uh, but that's not the case here. The clause doesn't specify any rules at all. I would in fact say it's exactly the case here because even the rules specified in our clause do not exist. I'm confused. I thought you began by accepting that there was a valid arbitration agreement here and the question was what it provided for. This case seems to hold there was not a valid arbitration agreement, so I'm having difficulty seeing so I have, how... So I have two alternate arbitrations. I, I was finishing the Sorry, thought. Sorry, I, I have difficulty seeing how this case assists you if you've already conceded that there's a valid arbitration agreement. It's fine if you withdraw your concession, but I'm confused. Sorry. I have two arguments. My first argument was that just the word Singapore would not mean that only SIAC will be the only arbitral institution which will be administering this arbitration. My second argument is that, and that's, that's a without prejudice argument to the first one. My second, arbitration, uh, my second argument is the clause in itself is void ab initio because no reasonable interpretation can be given to it which would, which would be uh, you know, completely not confusing. Because you cannot say that, that, that uh, 
you know, that's, that SEAC is the only institution which will govern this arbitration. I think your time is up, but I thought the way Mr. Landau put it, namely, this is obviously an institutional arbitration clause. The parties obviously agreed to arbitrate, obviously agreed right. to institutional arbitration, obviously agreed to institutional arbitration in Singapore. What did they intend their fair, duh, SIAC, no? Your time's up. And that's where I disagree. <laughs> what do we do next? For the second jurisdictional objection, please welcome Mr. Pratik Bagaria, partner, Singularity Legal. Haiban Bhattacharya, partner, Luthra and Luthra, counsel for the claimant. Perhaps counsel can identify themselves. Uh, I'm counsel Pratik Bagaria of Singularity Legal, appearing on behalf of respondent number one in this proceeding. I am honored one by I honored one Bhattacharya, partner Lutra and Lutra for the claimants. And who begins? The respondents. Very well. Members of the tribunal, arbitration is a process to resolve disputes before a tribunal by consent of both the parties. Unequivocal consent of both the parties is sine qua non to refer disputes to arbitration. Unequivocal, is that right? Who says that? Well, this I thought is it just consent. Who added unequivocal? Well, the fundamental rule of arbitration is that when two parties consent unequivocally, they go to arbitration. And no. Uh, I would. No, the fundamental rule of arbitration is when two parties consent to arbitration, they go to arbitration. Nobody stuck unequivocally in either the New York Convention, the Indian Arbitration Act, or the Singapore Arbitration Act, right? Well, also, well, I, I don't understand what, sorry, so I'm going to, uh, just as another aspect of Mr. Bourne, I want to ask, uh, what is the meaning of equivocal consent? How can you, either you consent or you don't consent? What does absolutely. it mean to unequivocally or equivocally consent? Well, I think uh, from, our, from my perspective, it's the arbitrator's answer is my point, that there is either consent or no consent. And if there is consent, it's unequivocal consent. There cannot be half a consent or no consent to the arbitration. And I think uh, keeping the word play aside, I, I, I meant what the arbitrator understood me to say, that there, is, there has to be consent, a complete consent, without any concession whatsoever. And at the time of drawing up this arbitration agreement, the parties have the ability to decide the architecture of their dispute resolution process. This is known as party autonomy. They can decide the scope, the length, the bench strength, the law applicable, the language, the mechanism of the dispute resolution process. However, once the agreement is signed, the contours of the dispute resolution process are set in stone. The arbitrator is a creature of this process and has to limit his jurisdiction, temporis, personae, and materiae, to the four corners of the arbitration agreement. Under no circumstance, and as my learned co-counsel co -counsel just cited a very relevant judgment, can one party or the arbitrator decide to change these boundaries drawn by the parties in the form of the arbitration agreement. In the present case, at the time of entering into the arbitration agreement, the parties found it commercially reasonable to design the dispute resolution mechanism as follows. First, reasonable attempt of amicable resolution which shall continue for not less than 60 days, followed by a notice of 15 days by a party acknowledging the failure of amicable resolution. Finally, post this minimum period of 75 days, consent by both the parties to arbitrate the dispute. It's, not, seri it's not seriously your case, is it, that in the middle of that period of time, before that, time of, uh, that period of, has elapsed, nobody can get emergency relief? Well, my, my case is exactly that. My case is that the consent to arbitrate has a temporal limit in this matter. The consent to arbitrate matures only post the expiration of the 75 days. And what I would like to submit... What, what do you mean that consent to arbitrate matures? Arbitration clauses aren't teenagers. They're agreements. That's why you call them arbitration agreements. The consent is here in the JVA agreement. The question is, if there's a violation of procedural rules, what sanction should we apply? Why should we get rid of the arbitration clause? And why should we prevent a party from getting emergency relief? Well, I would I beg understand. to differ slightly with the learned arbitrator. 
Uh, in fact, arbitration clauses can mature, and there are several instances even by investment tribunals uh, which say that there is a temporal limit on the tribunal's jurisdiction. Let's take an example of Abaclat versus Argentina, and I would cite the dissenting opinion of, uh, of Absab, where he says that which, there are- which, which opinion? Uh, a dis dissenting opinion of Professor Abisab. Uh, that, that would be not the majority then. Uh, okay, so I would then move to the other, uh, other judgment of ICS versus Argentina where Abaclat's dissenting opinion was cited with approval where they looked at the 18-month uh, clause in the Argentina BIT and they examined whether the arbitration clause has matured before the lapse of the 18-month period. But don't you think uh, BIT arbitration clauses are very different from what we are dealing with here? Where they, you know, well, the concept... The question of maturity in, that you're referring to in that context is completely different from a negotiation but, clause. Well, well, you know, I would beg to differ again on this one. Today, let's, let's look at the arbitration clause we have. The consideration today is not whether the claimant in its unilateral judgment feels that the negotiation periods have failed or the negotiation of the dispute cannot happen. The parties at the time of entering into the agreement specified that the negotiation would only fail if the 60-day period minimum of amicable resolution happens and, very importantly, a 15-day notice acknowledging that the negotiation has failed is given by the party. If you see clause number two at clause 30.1, it says post this failure is when parties refer the dispute to arbitration. Now, in this scenario, it's my humble submission that the temporal jurisdiction of this tribunal it remains unsatisfied today. You have two minutes. I would like to submit that the arbitration clause matures only after this 60 plus 15 day period. I would like to submit that this notice of arbitration was issued only 30 days after the notice of dispute, much in advance of this minimum 75 day period. Even if we assume the dispute arose on September 1, that is still short of the 75 day period. The tribunal today is thus constituted under a notice of arbitration, which is issued before the consent of arbitration between the claimant and the respondent has matured. This is really a triumph of form over substance, isn't it? I mean, isn't the reality that these parties had fallen out, and if they were to meet during this 75-day period, uh, period, there would not have been any productive discussions? Well, you know, it may be the right position, and uh, the arbitrator may have the, the, the ability to take uh, that position. However, unfortunately, the arbitrator's hands are tied by the party's autonomy, and the parties have decided that it's only after this 75-day period does any tribunal, including this emergency arbitral tribunal, have are the right to arbitrate Are disputes. you suggesting that if the party said that I'm not going to negotiate, go to hell, I'm not going to be talking to you at all, the, you, can't, you still have to wait for 75 days? Well, I would say in that situation, at least the notice of 15 days notifying the failure of arbitration could have given the claimant a right to come to this tribunal. I'm, I'm not giving a concession. I'm saying even in that situation, that would be an essential step. Absence of this notice does not lead to maturing of the arbitration consent. And in the absence of the consent, the tribunal today finds itself, finds its hands tied. Why isn't this just a procedural provision, a time limit, just like the other time limits in arbitration? We, the tribunal, can address violations of time limits just the way we do other issues. Why should we conclude that our hands are tied? Anyway, your time's up too. Do the claimants have a response? May I invite uh, the tribunal, sir? attention to the two clauses it paraphrased. The clause starts at 30 with the dispute resolution clause. Clearly, it's a multi-tier dispute resolution clause. 30.1 deals with efforts to settle the matter amicably. 30.2 deals with the arbitration agreement. 30.1, since it deals with the agreement of the parties to settle the matter amicably, it's clearly not an arbitration agreement. As a result, this particular aspect of this entire agreement has to be dealt in terms of Clause 31, which says that Clause 31 has to be construed in accordance with Indian law. So the first question that would arise is whether the entire obligation taken under Clause 
is an agreement which is enforceable in law. If it is not enforceable in law, then the question of whether an arbitration begun in terms of a violation or a breach of that requirement would make the arbitration void. So the first question is whether the agreement to mediate or the agreement to settle is enforceable in law and in terms of Indian law. Now there is overwhelming Indian jurisprudence on the fact that such this a... This is a very, very uh, artificial analysis, isn't it, to separate 30.1 from 30.2. So 30.1 is governed by Indian law, 30.2 is governed by the law of Singapore. Is that your position? No. I'm saying 30.1 certainly being not an arbitration agreement is governed by Indian law. The validity and etc. of the arbitration agreement has to be seen under the perspective of Singapore law. But in the present circumstance, if 30.1 is not an arbitration agreement, it forms the part of the remaining agreement and the proper law of the contract is to be applied to construe whether such agreement is enforceable under the relevant law concern, when, which is clearly agreed by the parties to be Indian law. In when, when Article 30, subparagraph 2 refers to the, <coughs> the dispute, which dispute does it mean? The dispute is the dispute which has been uh, raised before the arbitral tribunal. Uh, under Article, under Article 30.1? Under Article 30.2, it refers to the dispute which is referred in Article 30.1. So you're really saying that these two interrelated provisions are governed by different laws and don't have anything to do with each other? No, they have certainly something to do with each other. But my submission is that these two particular uh, provisions have to be interpreted under two different laws. And my first submission is... Well, that's is just that as crazy as a three-person emergency arbitrator tribunal. <laughs> <laughs> Why would we possibly interpret two different provisions in the same clause that are closely related, a very customary multi-tier dispute resolution provision under different laws? Yeah, my submission is that 30.1 uh, under no circumstances can, can be construed even under Singapore law to be an agreement to arbitrate. Because under every uh, law of arbitration, it is only when the parties agree to arbitrate. But that's, that's no different from law. saying, if you take the first sentence of 30.2, that may not be an, arbit an arbitration agreement. But if you take all of it, it is. No, in I was coming to 30.2 after no, I'm just saying it's a matter of principle. What you're doing is you're slicing up the contract into small segments and then saying, well, that segment is not an arbitration agreement, but isn't the reality under one heading and it's all one regime? Uh, the way the arbitration agreement works internationally is that the arbitration agreement has to be construed for the purpose of XYZ purposes under the relevant law of the seat, and the remaining contract has to be construed under the relevant law as the parties have agreed. And in the present context, in the parties have agreed that the proper law of the contract which governs the contract, which includes Article 30.1, has to be indeed construed under Indian law. Are you suggesting that if there was a conciliation clause in, in 30.1, that would be in part two of our, or part three of our act, the Indian act, and so far as 30.2 is concerned, it would go to the Singapore act? If, yes, certainly. If 30.1 had been a conciliation proceeding, that conciliation proceeding in that circumstance had to be conducted under part three, and section 77 of part three goes on to say that you really can't go into arbitration as long as your conciliation proceedings are on. Unless, of course, you need a relief, Isn't which is emergent in character. And in that circumstances also, I could have claimed a uh, relief before the emergency arbitrator. But isn't, is, isn't that really artificial to say that it, a conciliation proceeding would be governed by one set of laws and the arbitration which follows the conciliation, if it doesn't get resolved, would be under a different set of laws? I, I beg to differ, since the only agreement between the parties is to arbitrate under Singapore law, being the seat of Singapore. Everything else has been decided by the parties to be governed by the Indian law. And under the circumstances, I would submit that 30.1 had to be construed in terms of Indian law. And under Indian law, these agreements are not enforceable. Further, there is, Why there is also... Why is it not enforceable under Indian law? This in, it's not enforceable under Indian law for lack of certainty because this is only an agreement to negotiate, which right. is in effect an agreement to agree. And under Article uh, Section 29 of the Contract Act, right. this has been held to be unenforceable. Would, would you agree that when we come to interpret the phrase in Article 30.2, in case the parties are unable to settle the dispute amicably, that's to be interpreted under Singapore law? Indeed. And so under Singapore law, we would need to consider whether what the parties intended about an amicable settlement had been achieved? Correct. I've so what's the point of this whole Indian law argument? Right. If I say that when, when the purpose of the validity of the arbitration agreement has to be considered, 
Singapore law has to be applied. So far as reading of these two independent clauses is concerned, to see whether 30.2 is satisfied, the only language used there is the parties have failed to settle amicably. It does not say that the parties have failed to comply with 30.1. There is no word called precondition in 30.2. But when we come to understand, when we try to understand what the parties meant by settling the dispute amicably, are we supposed to close our eyes to 30.1 and the procedures there? Certainly not. When we are looking at 30.1, all I'm suggesting is that it is to be interpreted in terms of 30.1, in terms of Indian law, and having satisfied a without prejudice argument that even if it is agreed that 30.1 is mandatory and it ought to have been performed, my second argument is that it has been substantially complied with, and a party which has resigned from the settlement talks cannot be allowed to raise an objection that this arbitration is bad because that procedure is not followed. But hasn't the respondent said our hands are tied, and isn't there a lot of force to that? There are very specific timetables, turning to your second argument, there are very specific timetables in Article 30.1. We, the tribunal, are creatures of the party's consent. The party's requirements regarding time periods weren't satisfied. We can't do anything. Factually, the submission of the uh, respondents is incorrect. Just one more thing. Why do you say that just because in one meeting a particular representative walked out or stormed okay. out, that's the end of the negotiation? You could cool uh, down the parties have made on, the parties, It's just not one meeting. The parties are made on 4th, 11th, and 15th, and they met consistently. The facts also suggest that on the 15th meeting, the respondents walked away. And under these circumstances, with the, with the danger of them invoking the guarantee, the only way we could have got this particular relief is by having claimed first the notice for arbitration, because without a notice of arbitration, I would not have been able to invite this arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction to pass an emergency order. I'm, afraid, I'm afraid your time is up. Thank you. For the third jurisdictional objection, please welcome Mr. Umesh Nidumuri, partner in this talk, for the respondents, and Ms. Sheila Auja of Council Anand Novri for the claimant. Can Council remind the tribunal who goes first? Introductions again would be helpful. My name is Lomish, partner with Indus Law, and I represent uh, Chesapeake in this particular dispute. Uh, the submission that I would like to make before this honorable tribunal is Chesapeake has wrongly been called for this arbitration. There is absolutely no jurisdiction in so far as Chesapeake is concerned. The reason being, Chesapeake is not a party to the arbitration agreement that has been invoked before this honorable tribunal today. What has been invoked before this honorable tribunal today is clause 30 of the arbitration clause. I am neither a signatory nor a party to the joint venture agreement that was entered into primarily between my subsidiary company and Pipe Limited. So in the absence of an arbitration agreement, I would respectfully submit that no orders can be passed as against Chesapeake. Now I would like, just like to brief this honorable tribunal in so far as the important facts which would be relevant for the purpose of uh, this particular case. Can you just help me on this? What, what, uh, what threshold do we, do we apply to the question of jurisdiction? Right. So I think there would be consent between the councils insofar as the law applicable. The law applicable would be the Singapore law. Under the Singapore law, it's very clear that the strict rule needs to apply. There are very few exceptions to the strict rule. The strict rule basically contemplates that only parties to the arbitration agreement can be bound to the arbitration. No, no. Uh, we, we're, we're at the emergency stage at this right. point. We can't make a final determination as to whether your client is a party to the arbitration agreement. So what threshold do we apply in, getting, uh, in, in, in finding, making a determination one way or the other for present purposes? Well, in so far as that uh, issue is concerned, I'm sure the other councils will be making submissions on that. But in so far as Chesapeake is concerned, because as of now, a relief has been sought against Chesapeake to say that we should not be permitted to invoke the guarantee that has been granted in my favor. So therefore, the primary objection that I would raise before this honorable tribunal is that since we are not parties to this, mm -hmm. there is absolutely no order that can be passed by this honorable tribunal as against Chesapeake because it's not a party to the arbitration agreement at all. Can so I therefore, the test would be, I'm sorry, that, so therefore the test would be in the first place to determine 
whether or not Chesapeake is a party to the arbitration agreement. Can I press you on that just a moment? We're here as an emergency arbitrator. So far as I know, the standard when provisional measures are sought from a tribunal is whether prima facie there is jurisdiction. We can't, especially we as an emergency arbitrator, can't decide definitely whether there is or isn't jurisdiction. Don't we just make a prima facie assessment? That's right, you're, in fact, even at the prima facie stage, if this tribunal were to look at the salient facts of the case, as well as the Singapore law, it would become very evident that there is absolutely no jurisdiction as against us. So even at a prima facie stage, not even delving into it any further, even at the prima facie stage itself, it would become evident that no orders can be passed as against Chesapeake. But there you concede that on this issue and all the other issues, it's a prima facie jurisdictional standard? Yes, that's right, Your Honor. You have five minutes left. Yes. So very quickly, I would just like to point out certain facts of, the, of this case which would be relevant. Please see para 8 of the factual memorandum that's before this uh, tribunal. Now, the only reason why Chesapeake has been made a party to this particular dispute is that PIPE was required to submit a bank guarantee pursuant to the joint venture agreement. PIPE was not in a position to do it, so it requested the other party to, that is my subsidiary company, to issue a bond. Now, the subsidiary company was not in a position to issue the bond, so I, just out of an ex gratia thing, I just submitted the bond on behalf of the subsidiary company. Now, even when the bond was submitted on behalf of the subsidiary company, please see para number eight, the bond was submitted in favor of my subsidiary company. And the subsequent clause, clause seven, please see clause 7.1. 7.1 only says that in the event Raffles Gas calls in a bond, that is an inter arrangement between Raffles Gas and Pipe. I am not a party to 7.1. Please see 7.2. What 7.2 says is, Petro Gulf shall not call on any guarantee issued by Pipe without prior notice of 30 days. So therefore, but this, this is sorry. this is not perhaps meeting the point. Isn't the point that Petro Gulf has contracted on behalf of your client? That's I would I would respectfully submit that it's not. Petro Gulf is not my agent. It is just a mere financing well, I, I, arrangement. I, I, I accept that you're asserting that, but um, would you like to elaborate on why? Yes, I, I I would like to elaborate that. So the reason is this. It's, it was not a case, of course, the submission taken by the other side, it's, it's a case of principal and an agent relationship. It is not so. The reason is, when the bond was provided by me, that is Chesapeake, to the other side, the bond was provided on behalf of my subsidiary company, and it was not as if I have taken over the obligations of my subsidiary company in the joint venture agreement. So what typically has happened is, there are two independent contracts which have not intertwined with each other, and which is the test that would be uh, required to be satisfied by the other side in order to show that the dispute resolution mechanism of joint venture agreement would also cover Chesapeake. So these are two independent contracts. There is a separate contract, and that contract that I have with the other side has not been incorporated specifically into the joint venture agreement in isn't, the absence of, I'm sorry. Isn't this a classic law school example of a group of companies case? You negotiated this contract. You've done most of the performance of this contract. If you were sued in Singaporean courts, I'm sure you would say that you could rely on the arbitration clause. Doesn't it make sense for all these proceedings to be resolved, all these disputes to be resolved in a single proceeding? Yes, I, I get your point. But uh, unfortunately, as per the Singapore law itself, it is not as if it's because it's a matter of convenience, all the parties need to be brought together. Singapore takes a very strict rule, and that is a rule. In fact, there are two judgments in the compilation itself. In fact, in those judgments, there was a specific reference of the second agreement into the first agreement. In my case, there is no reference of my agreement into the joint venture agreement, which makes the case a lot more stronger insofar as Chesapeake is concerned. Despite that, what the Singapore courts have held is that there should be a strict rule. There may be a reference to the other agreement. Ultimately, there has to be a specific and a clear and a definite incorporation of the dispute resolution mechanism of the first agreement into the second agreement, in the absence of which, even though the transaction may be similar, even though the parties may be similar, even though it may be a parent company of a subsidiary company, in spite of all of that, they cannot hold the arbitration clause as against uh, the subsequent party. The point there is slightly different, isn't it? But the, the, the issue put against you 
by the claimant is that, Ch that Petrogulf was merely a vehicle for Chesapeake, isn't it? That's, that's not the point dealt with in the Singapore judgments that you're talking about. It, uh, just because it's a parent subsidiary doesn't mean it's a vehicle, necessarily a vehicle. This is a case where you, you accept that Petrogulf has no assets, it's got no business, this is the first contract, it's done. You accept all that, right? Yes, we do accept all that. And this is completely based on party autonomy. Now, Pipe has agreed to enter into an agreement with my subsidiary company. In fact, at the negotiation stage itself, if this honorable tribunal were to see para number two and three, while the negotiations were going on between the parties, Pipe specifically asked Chesapeake to act as a guarantor and to be added as a party to the JVA. Chesapeake refused. We said up. we are not going to be guarantors. Yeah, time's so up. Ah, time's up. <laughs> Ms. Ahuja. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bourne. Um, I'm Sheila Ahuja, and I represent the claimant Pipe Limited. Um, I'd like to start with the question of the burden, as rightly asked by Mr. Landau, <clears throat> to which the answer, as Mr. Bourne provided, is that I agree that the burden to be discharged in determining this objection in your capacity as emergency arbitrators um, is that you need only form a prima facie view as to the question before you. Now, turning to that question... I'm not sure. I think I've changed my mind. Why is that the case? If, if I conclude there's definitely not an arbitration agreement, if I consider the matter, if we consider the matter and conclude we're not satisfied that there's an arbitration agreement, why should we go forward just because we also think that prima facie there might be? If we're able to form a concluded view that there is no valid arbitration agreement binding Chesapeake, why should we go forward? <clears throat> the test required under the SEAC rules of you is to form a prima facie view. If that prima facie view is that there isn't an agreement to arbitrate, then you must proceed on that basis. But that outcome can then be challenged in a, in a subsequent forum. But if you decide on a prima facie basis that there is, then it is um, a responsibility on <coughs> this tribunal to proceed with this emergency arbitration. And I would say that on a prima facie basis, it is, simply, it is very simple to establish that uh, this objection can't stand and there is an agreement to arbitrate. So it's, so it's not your case that the tribunal shouldn't look into the possibility of making a final determination because you might lead, uh, like to lead evidence on the point of whether Chesapeake was intended to be the real party to the arbitration agreement? I would say there's simply no need to do that. Mm -hmm. So I would invite you not to do that, and I would invite you to form a prima facie view only at this stage. Now, turning to the short point that you need to decide in this third ju jurisdictional objection, that objection is whether the agreement to arbitrate in the JVA can be invoked against the second respondent, Chesapeake. Um, and if it can, then the objection must fail. To that, I have three submissions. The first is in response to my opposing counsel. His proposition is one and only one, and that is that Chesapeake is not a party to the agreement to arbitrate in the JVA, and thus should not be a party to this arbitration. Now, that point is bad and simply does not stand the test of time. But hang on, hang on. Uh, isn't it the case that Chesapeake was asked to be a party and, it's, and it declined? Chesapeake, why, why isn't that a complete answer? You're right, Mr. Landau, that it could be inferred that although at some point Chesapeake was asked to be a party and it declined, um, the facts are that that in itself is not enough. What, mu what one must do is look at what stands behind the issue rather than simply what happened on the facts. So in other words, it's not a question of form, it's a question of substance. And in fact, this is what most common law systems consistently apply, starting with the Singapore position, which we are agreed on, which is that it's not the, the rule of privity itself, which is very basic and has been deployed over many years, that, that's relevant, but it's the exceptions to it that actually apply here. And so I would ask you to look behind the simplicity of that rule and look into those exceptions. So we, we just ignore the fact that Chesapeake said it didn't want to be a party. Just explain you, how that works. You can certainly start with the fact that they said they didn't want to be a party, but I would ask you not to stop there. 
and I would ask you to look at what else happened in the series of transactions that should lead you to an opposite prima facie conclusion. So precisely what is it that would let us conclude that even though they said and you accepted that they're not a party, we should still bind them to this agreement? What is the, what is the theory that would allow us to do that? There are, in fact, a plethora of theories, and I invite you to consider two Let's in the Let's start essence slowly, of instead of with the plethora. <laughs> um, I invite you to look at two of them in the essence of time. Um, the first of those is that the agreement to arbitrate contained in the JVA is incorporated by reference into the guarantee. So that then takes us to three subpoints. The first is, what is the test for incorporation? And to that, I ask you to turn to the case of International Research Corp and Lufthansa Systems, which I believe is in the tribunal bundle, and it was decided by the Court of Appeal in Singapore in 2013. The Lufthansa case, just briefly, concerned the challenge of the tribunal's ruling on jurisdiction pursuant to the Singapore International Arbitration Act. The gist of the challenge was whether an arbitration clause contained in one contract between two parties bound a third party who subsequently entered into supplemental agreements with the original two parties. Now, this case suggests that the first issue to look at, and if I can take you to paragraph 34 on page 150, is what is the text? We don't have it, I'm afraid. I see. Um, I was under the impression that it was given to you in your bundle, but you could I should for somebody to be sacked. I'm sorry. That's fine. Please continue. <laughs> um, I, shall, I shall read it out to you um, because, in, in fact, I intend to rely on a very short um, passage, uh, extract of paragraph 34. Is there any objection to this? Is, can, I, can I respond now? Or? We'll come back to you. I believe my co-counsel... Have you given copies of this judgment to your opposing counsel? Um, the, the institution should have provided copies to both parties. As they I should have also <laughs> provided them to us, and we know where that's <laughs> led to. Uh, my apologies. Um, I, I shall ask... Uh, my team shall look into this suitably. Um, may I... Um, and indeed, my opposing counsel can consider this point as I make it. May I take you to paragraph 34, read out paragraph 34 of the judgment uh, in the absence of it being in your bundle? <clears throat> So the, the passage that I want to rely on is, the test is, the question is, and, and, the, and the Singapore Court of Appeal says here, the question in general is one of construction. So did the parties intend to incorporate the arbitration agreement in question by referring in their contract to it or to a document containing it? Now, moving another line down, it is ultimately a matter of contractual interpretation, and in undertaking this exercise, the task is one which must be done by having regard to the context and the objective circumstances attending the entry into the contract. Now, I ask you to pause there and look at the facts that my opposing counsel presented to you and that you have in your bundle, hopefully. Um, I ask you to look at this as a contextual question rather than a strict one, and the answer that you get to, whichever way you look at it, is of course there was an inextricable link between the two contracts, such that in substance it must be that the arbitration clause of one was incorporated into the other. And I say that for two reasons. One is the guarantee is in respect of the entire performance of the claimant, and this goes against a provision in Lufthansa that was argued otherwise. In fact, the Court of Appeal approves in Lufthansa that this is one scenario where this test could be satisfied in my favor. I'm, I'm looking in my bundle and trying to find the specific language in the claimant's guarantee that you say accomplished this incorporation. Which, which provision do you rely on? <coughs> Excuse me. The provision I rely on is paragraph 8. And if you turn to paragraph 8, which is on page 2 of your bundle, um, it says that uh, about four lines down, it says, to account for the provision of the bond by Petrogulf, Pipe was required to provide a bank guarantee in favor of Petrogulf, and Chesapeake is... You, you misunderstood. I was looking for language in the guarantee. This is a description about the facts. Yes, we do not have the language of the guarantee itself, but certainly from what we can infer from this, it says, the, the next line down, that the guarantee was intended to protect the entirety of the performance. So, so any time a bank provides a guarantee for a contract, or any time anyone provides a guarantee for a contract, you would say that incorporates the arbitration clause and requires the bank or some other financial institution to arbitrate 
under the underlying contract? Really? I uh, think all the banks in the world are going to be very surprised by that. Uh, as would I be if that was right. Um, what I do try to say is that in the process of looking at this as a contextual question, what one must do is look at the entirety of the transaction. So what was the guarantee intending to do? In this case, I submit that the guarantee was intending to protect the entirety of the transaction. That doesn't mean that every guarantee does that. In fact, a lot of guarantees don't do that and are specific guarantees, but this guarantee is general and it's complete. And it is so inextricably linked that the clause is incorporated, it's my submission. Your time is up. We've been very strict with everyone else. What's next? Thank you. Thank you. With that, we come to the end of the first part of this problem. The jurisdictional issue will be deliberated upon by the three-headed EA. We are pleased that Mr. Salve has been able to join us. We welcome him. You will need to wait for some time to see him on the panel. We will take a quick, very quick 10 minutes break now. Please come back in time for the arguments on the emergency interim relief. Thank you. The next round is the application for emergency interim relief. The tribunal is slightly modified now, with one head being replaced by definitely an equally able one. It still remains a three-headed emergency arbitral tribunal. For the first round of oral submissions, please welcome Ms. Elodie Dulac, partner King & Spalding, as counsel for the claimant, and Mr. Pramod Nair, founding partner, Arista Chambers, counsel for the respondents. We apologize for making the changes to the tribunal. We had a number of complaints about Mr. Landau and as a consequence replaced him with Mr. Salve. I'm sure he won't occasion any complaints in his treatment of counsel. Who, since this tribunal is imminent but imminently unprepared, who goes first? I would. Claimants, very well. If you could introduce yourself on both sides and then proceed. I assume you've arranged the time. Elodie Dulac, King and Spaulding, on behalf of the Clement, and uh, we've agreed we would each speak for seven minutes. May I proceed? Very well. So, on behalf of the Clement, I will address uh, the applicable legal test uh, for the grant of uh, emergency interim relief. My colleague will later address uh, how this test is met uh, on the facts in the present case. As a first point, I would like to stress that this application for emergency interim relief is based on Rule uh, 30 of the SSE rule, read together with Schedule 1, which gives uh, the tribunal great discretion in ordering uh, this interim relief. Um, rule 30 speaks of um, any injunction or interim relief the tribunal deems appropriate. So it's extremely broad. Um, section uh, 12 of the IAA and uh, Article 17 of the Model Law do not restrict that discretion at all. To guide this tribunal in the exercise of this discretion, um, the jurisprudence and commentators have identified a number of criteria to grant and term relief. Um, I think it will not be in dispute that these criteria will apply as well to the uh, emergency interim relief. What, what law is this we're applying? Is it Singapore law? Is it international law? What are we doing? I think as far as interim relief is concerned and looking at the jurisprudence, uh, you, do not, you can do it based on Rule 30. You, don't, you do not need to look at an applicable national law. And Rule 30 is basically gives you discretion and you can look at international practice to guide you in the exercise of that, that discretion. So there's no law that applies at all? We don't, we don't have any national law standards that limit our discretion? Apart from mandatory uh, Singapore law, uh, which I do not think would come to play here, uh, you do not have any limit to your discretion coming from national law. That's surprising, but go ahead. I am French. Um, so turning to, I will address uh, so the three criteria which have been typically identified. The first one has been alluded to earlier, which is prima facie jurisdiction of the tribunal. 
Uh, the second one is the existence of a risk of serious harm if the relief is not granted. And the third one, uh, the urgency um, of the relief sought. So prima facie jurisdiction, I will just briefly come back to it because it has been discussed earlier. Um, so you do not need to make a final determination on jurisdiction provided the prima facie test is met. It's a very low threshold. Um, I'm not aware of any published interim measure decision in which a terminal has denied jurisdiction uh, in an interim measure proceeding. Uh, you just take as face value prima facie the facts as alleged by the claimants and see if they might give, uh, be a basis for your jurisdiction. Um, and as a point, or, uh, last point on that first criteria, tribunals have found that the existence of jurisdictional objections do not preclude the power of the tribunal to order provisional measures. Maybe we'll bring Mr. Landau back. <laughs> Um, unless the terminal has a question on this first criteria, I will move to the second one. Very well. So second criteria, the risk of a serious harm to the claimant if the relief is not granted. Um, so it's a, the existence of a risk, uh, we do not have to establish the certainty that this harm will occur. And it's a very fact-based and flexible criteria which uh, my colleague will address how it is met on the facts of the present case. Um, and just uh, in even the, the respondents uh, would like to apply a high threshold of irreparable harm uh, and in a sense which is found in a common law context of interim relief would not be granted if the harm could be uh, remedied by damages, um, you have no, uh, there is no basis to introduce a very high common law threshold in an international arbitration under the SAC rules. Isn't Singapore a common law jurisdiction? Why shouldn't we look to common law authority? Because you're an international tribunal and... Uh, but we're seated in Singapore. And you uh, are deciding under the SAC rules, uh, so there is no basis to restrain that uh, discretion by incorporating a criteria uh, which is not required in the rule and has not been endorsed uh, by the majority of tribunal in a commercial arbitration context. So what criteria should, if we're going to ignore Singapore, what criteria should we look to? I think the commonly uh, applied criteria would be serious harm, uh, and that's the criteria we submit you should apply here. Very well. So not, meaning you do not require, you could order provisional measures even if, if damages could uh, repair the harm in your opinion. Hmm. And I'll move then to the last criteria, uh, urgency. And um, the way it has been interpreted is, uh, again, quite, quite flexible. If basically, if the harm could happen before you render your word on the merits, then uh, the measures are urgent. Meaning it doesn't have to be, there shouldn't be, n there doesn't need to be a risk that the harm is going to happen tomorrow. It should happen, um, be likely to happen before you render your word on the merits. And you, by that you mean the ultimate arbitral tribunal, not the emergency arbitrator, renders its award. Yes. So that could yes. be two or three years. Yes. Very well. Would, under your standard of flexibility and discretion, a party ever be unable to get interim relief? Absolutely. Can you give us some examples? It seems to me this threshold is so low that it would be a very rare case where the emergency arbitrator wouldn't be deciding the substance of the case. Every party well, is seriously hurt if it has to pay money or doesn't get paid money, no? It may not be serious um, and uh, on the facts of the case. And hypothetically, I'm not absolutely not considering it's the case here, uh, the harm may be uh, highly hypothetical. This is just money here, right? How much, we're talking about $20 million, is that right? Yeah, that's not pocket money for everyone. Mm, it's not pocket money, but on the other hand, it's the kind of money that's a dispute in most, many arbitrations, no? Are you saying that interim relief is to be granted by an emergency arbitrator on one day's notice in a very substantial proportion of all cases? That seems preposterous. No, I'm not saying it should be in, uh, uh, I don't think you should act differently than the tribunal would in deciding on this request for interim measures. Um, and again, um, the sayers harm, and my colleague will address it, uh, will be based on the facts of the case, where here we see payment of 20 million would cause serious harm. It may not be in all cases, it does here. 
Um, and again, the harm, uh, uh, so in the present case, is not, hypo not hypothetical. In other instances, there may not be any certainty the measure will happen or any like, likelihood the measure will happen. Here, the money has already been requested and my colleague will address it further. So it is not highly hypothetical. Don't we also have to consider whether our relief would prejudge the merits? And aren't you really asking here as interim relief what you want as final relief, namely not to have to pay? We're asking it on a provisional measure basis. Uh, and you do not make any determination of the merits. And actually, one criteria I do not, uh, did not address because we don't think it applies, but the minority of tribunals have applied it, would be the existence of prima, prima facie case on the merits. So at most, you would be making a prima facie determination on the merits and absolutely not prejudging the merits. What's the point of a performance bond if emergency arbitrators could stop their call in many cases, as long as it's more than $15 million or so? Well, this is the object of the dispute. Um, and the amount, uh, that's the object, uh, the very, uh, uh, it's at the core of the arbitration. Um, very so well. That was uh, your last I have, chance. I, have one, I have one question which I'm not very clear about. Does the claimant say that it is not obliged to pay on the bond? or Do you resist the payment of a bond because of a potential claim the claimant has in damages? Yes, my colleague will address it further, but uh, the payment has, been, uh, has not been made. Very well. Respondents. Good evening, uh, presiding arbitrator. Good evening, co-arbitrators. Pramod Nair, counsel for the respondents. I think there is, uh, and I must start off with this, I think there is some common ground in terms of the legal principles to be applied, but of course, uh, there is uh, definitely going to be a divergence in terms of the actual facts and how it relates to the principles. But even with respect to the, there are uh, some points which I thought I should bring to the attention of the tribunal. The point that was made by the counsel for the claimant in terms of the threshold of jurisdiction being a very low threshold is not something which is consistent with arbitration practice. The well-settled position is that a tribunal may decide upon provisional measures prior to establishing its jurisdiction over the dispute if it appears that there is prima facie a basis for asserting such jurisdiction. So therefore, to put it conversely, if a tribunal does not have a basis for um, jurisdiction on a prima facie analysis, it should decline a request for interim measures. And that's uh, an aspect which needs to be kept in mind, given the fact that there are serious jurisdiction objections which have been raised by the council before me. Uh, jurisdiction objection one, that the claimant leapfrog the stage of making attempts to resolve the dispute through dialogue. The dispute is not yet moot. It is not crystallized into an arbitrable dispute. Uh, jurisdictional objection number two, which is that an entity which is not a party to the arbitration agreement has been named as a respondent, and that's a serious issue that needs to be tried. And then the arbitration has been initiated on the basis of a pathological clause. So far from there being a prima facie basis for the tribunal to exercise jurisdiction, uh, on a prima facie basis, it is clear that there are very serious questions of jurisdiction that have been raised, uh, and especially given the clause is potentially pathological, uh, this is not a case where the tribunal should entertain an application for emergency relief. But you accept the concession that your co-counsel previously made that the standard is one of prima facie jurisdiction? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, and therefore, the question that I would uh, urge the arbitral tribunal to decide is based on the facts that are available to the tribunal at this stage and keeping in mind the fact that no affidavits, no evidence has yet been led before the tribunal, uh, on the basis of the material available today, is there a sufficient basis for the tribunal to conclude that there is prima facie jurisdiction over the merits of the case? And if that ans the answer to that question is, is in the negative, then the application for interim measures should not proceed further. Do you accept the position of the claimant that no system of law should be applied and just rule 30 of the SIAC rules should apply? Well, on that, uh, I would disagree. In fact, if I could just uh, quote from an authority, uh, this is uh, Gary Bourne, International Commercial Arbitration, first edition, 2009, page 1981. Is that uh, in our bundles? <laughs> <laughs> the it's written in another chapter after that. <laughs> <laughs> there is another edition. Uh, the, in academic writing, it has been, um, 
stated, and I think this is also the consensus of academic writing, that an emergency arbitrator or any arbitral tribunal at the stage of interim me measures must have regard to the standards commonly applied by international arbitral tribunals. And therefore, these standards are one, the existence of serious or irreparable harm to the applicant that needs to be established. Second, the requirement of urgency to be established because this is cited to be a case which is so urgent that it cannot even await the constitution of the arbitral tribunal and must be decided therefore as a matter of urgency. But don't and you agree see, that if, if we don't, if there's no injunction and you take the money on the bond then the, so far as the relief that the claimant is seeking at this stage is concerned, yes. it would become infructuous, wouldn't it? Yes, it, it would become infructuous. And, and the question, therefore, is, is this something which would prejudice the claimant to such an extent that it will cause the claimant irreparable harm? But that, that's the second dimension. That's, that's the second dimension. On the first dimension of urgency, what do you have to say? Well, in terms of the urgency, well, we agree that uh, there is a 30-day period within which the bond can be called. The bond has been called once, probably not uh, in accordance with the terms of the uh, language of the clause, but it's likely to be invoked again. And therefore, we don't contest the requirement of urgency here. Uh, but the, the challenge really is to the existence of a prima facie basis of jurisdiction. And secondly, I think the other area of divergence is that counsel for the claimant uh, referred to Rule 30 of the SEAC rules to state that there is really no uh, law applicable and a tribunal can decide uh, and issue an order of interim measures of protection uh, and any interim order that it deems appropriate. So this is really an area of non leake and the tribunal has unbridled discretion. That, I would respectfully submit, is not correct, and it's also not the correct test, because Article 30 refers to the powers of an arbitral tribunal. The powers of an emergency arbitrator don't flow from Article 30. It flows from uh, Rule 8 of Schedule 1. And Rule 8 of Schedule 1 provides that the emergency arbitrator shall have the power to order or award any interim relief that he deems necessary. There is a huge amount of difference between an order that is appropriate and an order that is necessary. It may well be that on the facts of this case, uh, an order uh, in restraining the invocation of the bank guarantee may be appropriate in the facts of the case. I would say that even that threshold is not met. But the threshold that the claimant you has to two meet minutes remaining. is much higher. The, the claimant really has to establish that the invocation of the bank guarantee has to be injuncted and that such a measure is necessary. And that, goes, that goes to the standard under the SIAC rules and not so much the applicable law, if any, in interpreting that standard. Do you accept the claimant's submission that no national law informs our decision? Uh, on that, I would respectfully disagree because the power of a tribunal to order interim measures and the order of a tribunal includes the power of an emergency arbitrator is comparable to the power of a court to order interim measures of protection. I'm shocked so, by that. You say we are to act like a Singapore court. None of us are admitted in Singapore. Well, in terms of the, the well, principles that ought to be applied, and of course, uh, in due course, expert evidence will be led before the tribunal in terms of establishing the content of Singaporean law on this point. Not but in an emergency arbitration, I wouldn't have thought. Well, uh, and why? I thought parties agreed to arbitrate just to get out of national courts, and now you're saying we should apply, are we supposed to apply Singaporean standards for injunctive relief in a Singaporean court? Is that what you're suggesting? Well, uh, again, going back to the commentary, and the commentary is, of course, distilled from uh, principles applied by national courts as well as arbitrators. And I would respectfully submit that each of these principles are principles that have been evolved by national courts and arbitral uh, tribunals over a uh, a period of time and they've crystallized into well accepted principles that any tribunal including an emergency arbitrator must apply a and therefore the issues that really need to be looked at are one is there a serious issue to be tried and this is uh, clearly a point of uh, Singaporean law but it's also a point of Indian law and Indian law has some relevance here it's a point of English law as well a party seeking interim relief must make a threshold showing of a right to relief uh, and um, Whichever standard is applied, and uh, the claimant's application will not meet it, as my colleague your, Mr. Landau will explain. Your time is up, and as you have seen, we are very strict. Thank you, Mr. Arbitrate. The final round of arguments on whether emergency interim relief should be granted or not will be argued by Mr. P. V. Kapoor, senior counsel, on behalf of the claimant, and Mr. Toby Landau, QC, on behalf of the respondents.
Can counsel remind the tribunal who's going first here? I think I will go first. Very well. Introduction. Is this working? Yes, it is. My name is P.V. Kapoor. I represent the claimant. And my learned friend, Mr. Landau, Toby Landau, represents the respondent. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, role today is limited to seven minutes during which time I have to convince you, the tribunal, that I have a good prima facie case, why the tribunal should grant an injunction. Normally this doesn't happen. Seven minutes is too little, but nevertheless. You've just used up one of those seven yes, minutes. Yes, I know. But then what I have to say for prima facie case is less than five minutes. We'll hold you to that. Yes. I. Uh, in order to establish that my client has a good prima facie case, I invite the tribunal's attention to paragraph 8 of the statement of case that I have been provided. I suppose we have all the same thing. We are, we are paragraph there. Paragraph 8, uh, last four lines of that paragraph, starting the claimant's guarantee was intended. Do your honors have that? The claimant's guarantee was intended to protect Petrogulf and Chesapeake in the case of call on the bond, important words now, due to breach by pipe. Please mark those words. Due to breach by pipe. Next, clause seven of the JVA only set out the procedures for Petrogulf to call on the claimant's guarantee in the event Raffles Gas called on the bond. And I'll just read clause seven in a minute. So two important points that I want to make straight away is first, that the guarantee was meant to protect Petrogulf and Chesapeake only f due to breach by uh, pipe, that is by client. So if the breach is attributable to Petrogulf, the bond cannot be called on. That's number one. Number two, if you look at clause seven, this provides the procedure for calling on the guarantee after the Chesapeake's bond has been encashed uh, by, um, by, by Petrogulf. What 7.1 says is in the event that Raffle Gas calls on the bond, Petrogulf will inform Pipe within five days and the parties will thereafter jointly determine who is responsible for call on the bond within a reasonable period. So important thing, one, the guarantee is only meant to protect Chesapeake and Petrogulf for breach by pipe. Therefore, once the guarantee has been cashed by, by, Petro, by Petrogulf, Clause 7 specifically provides that both parties will meet and decide to whom is the blame attributable. Therefore, until this discussion takes place and a clear decision is taken as to who is to be blamed, and only event of it being found that the blame lies at my doorstep, will the guarantee be uncashable and not otherwise. I was following you up until that last sentence. Where does it say that only if it is jointly agreed who is responsible, yes. the, the bond can yes. be Yes, uh, let me cashed. read that again. Let me just re-emphasize what I said. The guarantee itself provides it being uncashable if I am the one to be blamed for the breach. I hope that part is clear. No, it's not. All right, let me read those last four lines again. Of the claimant's guarantee was intended to protect Petrogulf and Chesapeake in the case of a call on the bond due to breach by pipe. So therefore, the breach has to be attributable to pipe. Only then the guarantee becomes uncashable. And now, therefore, Mr. Kapoor, the, 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 the point is, if you see the procedure 7.1 and 7.2, 7.1 says there is a notice and the parties have to try and obviously, when it yes. says will determine, we Quite right. attempt to determine. Quite right. It doesn't go thus far to say, and if they fail to determine, the bond shall not be encashed well, or pending dispute resolution. What I'm trying to say is the, 
the bond in terms is encashable only if the breach is attributable to pipe. In order to therefore encash the bond, it has to be determined that the breach is attributable to me and therefore 7.1 provides that parties will meet and decide who is the person who is to be blamed for the breach. Mr. Kapoor, you want us to read in a condition precedent into 7.1, is that it? I beg your pardon? You want us to read in a condition precedent that there must be a determination yes. of pipes. Yes, breach. indeed. Yes, indeed. Because that is how they, at least the, the, the document is worded, that the claimant's guarantee is intended to protect Petro Gulf and Chesapeake only if the breach is attributable to pipe. If the breach can't be attributed to pipe, which is a condition precedent, the guarantee cannot be encashed. And therefore, 7.1 follows it up by saying that parties must meet and decide who is to be blamed. Incidentally, it's also important to see that the guarantee can only be encashed by, Ches by uh, Petro Gulf and not by Chesapeake, even though both are beneficiaries. I assume that in addition to this interesting point, you would accept that if the bond were, were called, there would be serious harm or no? I beg your pardon? I didn't would would you that. accept that if the bond were called here, there would not be serious harm? There would be extremely serious harm. It's I'll, just I'll, money, no? I agree, it's just money, but it flies away to, to, to a Gulf country where I, uh, uh, to a company which has no known assets. So uh, the, the comparative hardship that I will suffer is far more disproportionate to the inconvenience that the other side will have if the guarantee is, for, if they're restrained from encashing the guarantee only for a short period of time during which the tribunal makes its award. The fact that the money flies away to a, a Gulf country shouldn't detain us too long. There's no, a New York it's, Convention. It's, what's, it's, what's the company that has no assets? Where do we see this in the record? No, it is right there. Um, it is somewhere there. You're referring to paragraph one, Mr. Kapoor. Yes, it is there. I've read. You can take it as, uh, as, as a fact. I don't think the other side is going to dispute that. Mr. Landa is not going to dispute that. You're not. Very well. <laughs> Very well. You've made that point. Someone's made that point. Yes. That's, the, that's the first. But so what about Chesapeake? But Chesapeake is also a beneficiary under the bond, isn't it? So far as Chesapeake is concerned, though it is a beneficiary to the bond, it cannot cash the bond. The, 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 as is apparent from, again, those last four lines. Uh, I was, I was, uh, asking the last two lines, actually. However, that. Clause 7 of the JVA only sets out the procedure for Petrogulf to call on the claimants. Yeah, I was uh, asking in the context of the asset point that you raised, because yes. Chesapeake has enough asset, doesn't it? Well, but the point is, we don't know where the money will go. Nobody knows where it will go. And besides, keeping in mind that the standard for ascertaining as to whether an injunction should be granted is a transnational test. You have to therefore weigh the balance of convenience, and the balance of convenience certainly is in my client's favor for the time being, because my guarantee is alive, the respondent is fully protected, and in the event you were to come to the conclusion that they're entitled to encash the guarantee, it could be alive and it can be encashed. On the other hand, the money goes away, probably to a company which has no known assets, to a foreign land whose laws I'm unfamiliar with, and I would have to thereafter go after them in case I succeed here, which puts me to a whole lot of inconvenience and multiplicity of proceedings. The whole thing can be decided here in a short period of time. I'm confused. Your, your co-counsel who set out the legal standard for us didn't mention balance of convenience at all. Where does that come from? Is this that, another one of these transnational principles? It is a transnational test. It is something that is applied to international arbitrations, especially keeping in mind that the parties, one of the parties is a United States party, one is an Indian party, and the third is a United Arab Emirates party, who have chosen Singapore as the seat of arbitration. Therefore, uh, there is really speaking no connection to a domestic forum. Uh, other than Singapore. Your well, time is up. Singapore is <laughs> Mr. Landau. <laughs> Thank you. Members of the tribunal, it's with some regret I have to begin with a reservation as to the constitution of the tribunal. Uh, 
we, we had understood that Mr. Landau would be sitting. <laughs> I, I personally was rather excited at that prospect, uh, but I'm afraid I just I proceeded. Do you want to turn to the substance, Mr. Landau? Sorry, forgive me. <laughs> yeah, you realize tribunal may be better off. So, uh, <laughs> members of tribunal, I will you, address. You're in a better place, not a worse place. You shouldn't be complaining. Sorry, can we start the clock again? Thank you. Uh, members of tribunal, I'm going to address you on the facts of the case and whether, according to the facts, you should grant the interim relief which is being uh, sought by the other side. There are two points. The first point is that there is no arguable case on the merits. The second point is that the balance of convenience is clearly in my client's favor, uh, clearly and unequivocally. Let me address those in turn. Firstly, there is no prima facie case on the merits. The JVA between the claimant and the first respondent is governed by Indian law, that's clause 31. It follows that clause seven of the JVA is to be construed in accordance with Indian law. Now, I appreciate this tribunal will not be familiar with Indian law. So I'm going to just, if you- That's a fair assumption. So forgive me if I just guide you through this. Uh, the claimant's guarantee and clause seven together uh, as a matter of Indian law, must be construed as a contract of indemnity. Uh, that we get from section 124 of the Indian Contract Act, 1872. A contract of indemnity is a contract whereby one party promises to save the other from loss caused to him by the conduct of the promisor or any other person. Now the reason for focusing upon this is to be clear about the nature of this contractual obligation. And that we get from paragraph eight of the agreed facts, line five. The claimant's guarantee was intended to protect Petrogulf and Chesapeake in the case of a call on the bond due to a breach by pipe. Claimant was required to provide a bank guarantee for an equivalent amount of $20 million to account for the provision of the bond to raffle gas. Claimant's guarantee was intended to protect Petrogulf in case of a call on the bond due to a breach, which squarely accords with the nature of a contract of indemnity as a matter of Indian law. Now, getting to the facts, forgive me, getting to the facts. That would be good. I'm grateful. Pursuant to clause four of the JVA, which we see at paragraph four of the agreed facts, claimant was the project leader. As the project leader, claimant was obligated to coordinate the work of the JV, organize regular JV meetings, and represent the JV in correspondence with raffle gas. The default on the contractual timelines when looking at this from a prima facie viewpoint is clearly the result of the claimant's breach of duty to coordinate the work of the JV. But and that I'm going to explain by way of three Mr. points. Mr. Lando, sorry, uh, you rightly made the point that under Indian law this could well be considered an indemnity. How do you respond to Mr. Kapoor's point? That this is virtually, as I understand, he said a conditional indemnity, that unless there was a breach, and he claims the breach has to be established either jointly or in adjudication, failing which the indemnity cannot be acted. How do you react to that? Uh, quite simply, there is no condition precedent. My learned friend has read that into the contractual language. That's a complete answer. And secondly, uh, you are looking at this from a prima facie basis. Is there a reasonable prospect of success on the merits? On the agreed facts, which is all we have, the agreed facts point in the other way. Because on, yeah, the, agreed, on the agreed, can I just, forgive, forgive me. On the agreed facts, it is only the claimant that had responsibility for organizing meetings on the JV, communicating with raffled gas on behalf of the JV. Those, so, those facts may point in a particular direction, yes. but do they exclude the possibility of a prima facie case on the merits? That's difficult for us on one day's notice to conclude. Well, it's really the burden on the other side to prove their case on the merits. All I can do is argue on the facts that no. we have. What, ab what about 7.1? Why, if, if that was so, if in all circumstances Pipe was going to be held accountable, then why 7.1? Do you, do you mean why is 7.1 in the contract? Yeah. Well, 7.1 is, is a perfectly understandable but aspirational provision. It's a provision which says there should be a period of notice and there should be, of course, an agreement, if there can be an agreement, on uh, fault. But as a matter of Indian law, that is not going to be a binding obligation. It's an agreement to agree. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with putting something which is aspirational in the contract, but it doesn't help you for your present limited inquiry. 
your present limited inquiry is, have they discharged their prima facie burden on the merits? Now, on for, for that, we have only got the agreed facts. The agreed facts point to solely the claimant's obligation to communicate, to send messages through to Raffles Gas, to send messages back. And on that basis, the only, the only the, 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 what, what's quite clear here is that if you say, well, whose fault was it? Of course, you're in a difficult position at this stage, but you have to ask the question, whose fault was it? It's more likely their fault. The, the agreed facts point to both the provisions you've cited, but also to a complex joint venture agreement whose terms haven't even been included by counsel in the bundle that we've been given. How can we decide now that those terms do not impose, they must impose obligations on both parties. How can we resolve your dispute now? There's no conceivable way we the can. The only, uh, I, I, if I may say, it's a, a particularly, uh, indeed unusually perceptive remark. The, the, the only can deal with this is by burden of proof at this stage. The burden must be on the claimant who is asking for this extraordinary measure. The extraordinary measure is for this tribunal to step in at this stage and indeed change what may be quite a clear contractual mm -hmm. obligation uh, to provide a guarantee to let a bond be called upon. So mm -hmm. if they can't discharge that burden, well, that's their issue. That was also an unusually perceptive response. <laughs> the, the burden, though, if we're going to play burden-shifting games, is an unusually low burden in the sense of a prima facie case on the merits. How can we possibly decide now that there isn't a prima facie case on the merits. We've been given a very complex dispute, and there's, I take it from the limited nature of your submissions, no disagreement that there'll be serious injury here if this bond is called. No, um, th there were two points, If you, I know it may feel like a long time ago, but I introduced this with two points. Uh, so the first point is a reasonable case. Is there a reasonable case on the merits? The second point is the balance of convenience. What did you well. say about Let's his point on the assets that it's a, it's a company which has no assets, Petrogulf is going to take it, we, how do they ever recover the money back if they succeed in the arbitration? There is no evidence here of a risk of dissipation. The parties have freely contracted with each other. They've done so knowing that my client has no assets, that my client is in the UAE. It is no answer to say my client comes, as, as my learned friend said, from a foreign land. These parties knew each other, they freely contracted with each other. It's for them to show evidence of a risk of dissipation. Without that evidence, all that's happening in this case is a follow through on an agreed contractual mechanism. The agreed contractual mechanism is we are protected in the event that we need protection. We need protection now. So all that's happening is exactly what was foreshadowed by the contract. It what more facts do you need though for serious, even irreparable harm than your client having no assets. Well, you'd need facts that my client intends to take the money and render it beyond reach. Those are the facts you need. Why would that be so? If your client has no assets, what is, what is the claimant to do in the event that the money is sent off to, to some bank account? Well, my client will have 20 million. But that's a presumption that your clients will keep that money in the bank. Yes, yep. and, that and that takes one to the risk of dissipation. I'm sorry, but it's for my learned friend in this extraordinary phase to show you that I, my client is going to be uh, ill-intentioned and will put that money beyond reach. For the it's next season, because the time is up, you'll have to dial back in next year. Thank you for your time. What an enriching experience. The most important session of the day will be the tribunal feedback, and the tribunal members will also discuss tips on oral advocacy. We will have to wait for five minutes, a very, very quick, I would say, toilet break, not a coffee break. Please be back here in five minutes. Thank you. We've now come to the most awaited session, which is the tribunal feedback. And the distinguished tribunal members will also be sharing tips on oral advocacy. The panel will be moderated by Mr. Kabir Singh, member YSIC committee, partner Clifford Chance. And I believe the uh, panel members don't need any further introduction.
Hello? Yes. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Again, welcome back from the break. Um, I think you'll agree with me that we've seen a, a very, very high quality of participation today. And again, thank you once again to all of the speakers who took the time and effort to prepare for the session um, and to make uh, such sort of, you know, convincing, uh, well-articulated and sometimes challenging arguments to what was by no means an easy tribunal to manage. Uh, so thank you again to all the speakers. Um, and of course, thank you uh, to the tribunal as well uh, for being thoroughly prepared for actually engaging the speakers um, and sort of making their lives a little bit difficult so that we all had an entertaining time. So moving on from that, uh, we now come to sort of the last session of today, which is uh, the tribunal feedback um, and probably one of the most important parts of today because we actually get uh, to enjoy uh, and learn from the best and the greatest in the international arbitration world today. Um, so from that perspective, what we'll do first is we'll get the tribunal members to share some general comments on what their sense of the session was, uh, what they thought went well, what could have been done differently um, based on their experience. Um, and then we'll sort of put them on the spot a little bit by, by putting on a Q&A for them uh, to get them to share uh, some of their tips and secrets uh, on international arbitration advocacy. So Gary, perhaps can I ask you to start uh, with some opening words? possible because I don't have a mic. Um, it, it's actually very easy because it was, at least from my perspective, exceptionally good performances by everyone. It was a ridiculously difficult and unpleasant tribunal. We apologize all. I apologize on behalf of everyone um, for, the, for the difficult and abrasive questions. I thought all of the, all of the participants handled the, the answers with, with grace. Um, you, they've obviously learned the rules of you humor the most bad-tempered tribunals, you don't interrupt, um, you address their, their questions politely and concisely. Um, I, I don't have much additionally to, to say aside from being extremely impressed by everyone's performance. I'm sorry I came in late and uh from a grumpy judge to a grumpy Mr. Landau. <laughs> it was a very pre pleasant transition. And, uh, <laughs> but I must say the way the uh, lawyers handled it was remarkable. Standing up to Toby is not easy in the best of times. And I saw him in action uh, grilling uh, Ms. Auja, and I think she did wonderfully well. And all the, uh, it's, it's very clear the, the manner in which it was presented that uh, Everybody is top class and has a complete hold on how arbitration proceedings should be conducted, including when you have only seven minutes with the tribunal wanting to take four out of those seven in questions. Thank you. Toby? I'd like to focus on the last session. <laughs> I was deeply disappointed with the performance of counsel for the respondent. Uh, no, I think, actually, I don't really have anything useful to add, I'm afraid. I think it was a, an entirely artificial exercise uh, with a ridiculously short amount of time in front of an impossible, ill-equipped, uh, ill-prepared uh, Ill tribunal. Uh, and given those circumstances, I think it was just brilliant, uh, with, with one exception. <laughs> Mr. Kapoor, sir. I was not a member of the tribunal, so there's little I can say on behalf of the tribunal, but I can say about it. And I thought they were brilliant, very difficult. Some questions were difficult for counsel to answer, but they were met with, uh, with, with good answers. And um, this is exactly how these arbitrations proceed, not in the sense of time, but yes, these are the kind of questions, incisive and intelligent questions that are put across and uh, the only lesson one has to learn from this is be well prepared when you go for international arbitrations, especially SIAC. Thank you. I think everybody, everything has really been said already, so all I'd say is that if it was a four-member tribunal, we'd have a 2-2 two -two vote. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you very much for those, for those remarks. Now, moving on to sort of the panel discussion, as I'd like to call it, what I'm going to do now is talk to some of these uh, members of the tribunal about their experiences, uh, both as, as very eminent advocates in international arbitration as well as arbitrators, and to try and glean from that some learning points for those of us in the room. Now, 
uh, this is a young audience. This is an audience of young lawyers either already in the international arbitration circuit as counsel in, in law firms or in, in their own practices or students aspiring to join international arbitration. And you know, just sitting out earlier, I had hordes of questions about how people could develop their practices. So I said, please come and ask the experts. So what I'll start off doing is really talking about some of the challenges that typically face young lawyers uh, in the advocacy aspect of international arbitration. Now, it's a common complaint for many young lawyers that they don't get enough exposure uh, before a tribunal in terms of advocacy, that they're sort of hidden at the back doing the grunt work of research and submissions, but they don't actually get to articulate the arguments. Um, and, and one would have thought that that's particularly pervasive, perhaps in international arbitration, more so because we are, in a sense, moving away from oral arguments somewhat towards more written advocacy. And you know, those of us who have done it will learn that most, if not all, of the arguments sometimes are done by way of written advocacy, which with really a small amount of oral advocacy involved. So that's challenging, um, along with the fact that uh, many young lawyers today say that they have to start off with litigation. And in particular in India, it's very common out of law school to join a firm, to join a set of chambers, and to then you know, do litigation before the courts. How then do you transcend into arbitration? So these are interesting themes uh, that I know, you know face many young lawyers. They faced you know, me many years ago as well. And these are themes that I hope to explore today. So perhaps I could start the ball rolling uh, by talking about what is you know, commonly uh, discussed as the difference between uh, advocacy in litigation and arbitration. Now, it's, it's, it's said by some people that, uh, yes, you can be a litigator, but that doesn't mean you'll, you'll make yourself an um, effective uh, advocate before a tribunal. So perhaps if I can shoot the question first to Toby, um, is that your experience? And, and do you think that's true at all? between litigation and arbitration? Well, being an advocate in, 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 in those yeah. forums. I think, I think there is definitely a, uh, a difference between being a successful litigator in court and successful counsel in arbitration. And if I were to uh, pinpoint what that difference is, in litigation, you will be within one national court system with one set of assumptions and expectations. When you're in arbitration, you have to sweep away all of that. You cannot assume anything. The tribunal may be from a completely different legal system and tradition, and indeed it's likely to be from more than one legal system and tradition, and your opponent may be from a different legal system and tradition, which means that if you simply import what you have learnt as your tools of the trade in your own court, it can be a complete disaster. So the key to it is actually to unlearn what you do in your local court and to learn uh, what might be appropriate, which then will be on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the tribunal and depending on the particular circumstances. Thank you. Mr. Salvi, you've had experience, of course, uh, before the courts and international tribunals. In, uh, if I may just pick up from where Toby left off, the process of unlearning has to be very rigorous in India. Please do not bring the skills of the Court of Civil Procedure and Indian trial courts into any arbitration. The arbitrators will dislike you from the word go and your client has a bleak future. Arbitrations are all about resolving issues of moving ahead of getting along. Court proceedings are in a very different idiom where rules have to be followed. There is a much greater degree of formality. And the second thing, and I wanted to use this yesterday, when, but I couldn't make it. So I must say, there's a cultural difference which Toby mentioned. There's a cultural difference which you have to acknowledge, recognize, and sweep away. Look at the theme for yesterday. It said, has the long summer of arbitration come to an end? And are we looking at a winter? In India, it would be exactly the other way around. We hate summers, we love winters. And that, that's, the, that's the cultural problem which we have to address. When you go from India before a tribunal, and I have seen very, I don't want to name people, I've seen a very eminent silk from India who asked a very horrified tribunal to allow him to first cross-examine the claimant's witnesses and then put in his witness statements. And when asked why, he said, because that's what the Code of Civil Procedure provides and that's how we should do in an international arbitration. So this is, kind of, this is the kind of stuff which you have to unlearn. You have to learn to be quick, you have to learn to accommodate oral advocacy in the time available, and that was a good exercise you saw, seven minutes, nine minutes. Tribunals are very strict with time, unlike, at least unlike Indian courts, especially the Indian uh, trial courts. 
And thirdly, you have to know your case very well. You cannot discover it when you are arguing your case, which is another thing Indian lawyers have to unlearn. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Salve. Now, Siku, perhaps I could turn to you. Now, at, at a more practical level, I think one of the challenges facing you know, young aspiring lawyers is going to be that when they come out of law school, they'll necessarily tend to get within litigation uh, first. Now, do you see any benefit in that? Do you see any benefit in the skills that you get as a litigator and how they can be sort of transposed to, to your work as an international arbitration counsel? No, not really. I think if you, I mean, you can always make a choice then whether you want to go into arbitration or whether you want to go into court litigation. And um, So it's really what you think is your sort of mainstay. Uh, if you go into court litigation, as Mr. Salve and Toby both said, that you need to unlearn to get into the arbitration. I mean, I was recently in, in Mumbai in an arbitration with, um, where we were for a subsidiary of a foreign company, and you had a tribunal of three retired Supreme Court judges, and you were still looking at admission denial of documents and, and marking of exhibits. And, um, you know, we have to just get over all this, this hangover that we have with the CPC. So the best thing to do, I think, for people who are really interested in arbitration is um, to go into arbitration from day one but not to let court be completely behind you. I mean, you have to do some court work to get an idea of how it works because in every arbitration in India, at least, you're going to land up in court at some stage or the other. You're going to be in, whether it's in section nine, whether it's 14, whether it's you know, 27, whether it's uh, 34, but you're going to be in court. So you just can't ignore court work, but I think you can definitely concentrate, learn what arbitration is all about, and then learn a bit about how the court process works and get on with it. Thank you. Now, Gary, perhaps uh, moving at a more general level, again, you know, you've sat, obviously, as arbitrator on, on hundreds of cases and appeared as counsel, and so you've got the benefit of both sides of, of that table. Um, what have you uh, sort of seen as being the most frequent mistakes made by sort of, you know, younger advocates and those less experienced, and how can we learn from that? In, in some ways, I think it goes back to the original questions that, that you asked. I think. In fact, when you think about it, litigation and arbitration have as many similarities as they do dissimilarities. If, if you have to litigate between a, before a lower court judge in Orissa, you take a very different approach than you do if you're in the Delhi High Court. If you have to arbitrate before three retired German judges, <coughs> you may end up acting a little bit like a German litigator. I think at the end of the day, the most important thing, whether you're in litigation or in arbitration, is your audience, who's going to make the decision. And one of the things I've said in other contexts, I would repeat here, and also use as the, the most common mistake made by older as well as younger advocates, the most important part of oral advocacy isn't talking, but listening listening both to words and also to, to body language, trying to understand what it is that troubles the, the decision maker, either from what she says or what she does when, when she's listening to the parties and attempt to, uh, to address that. I think at the end of the day, one always has to remember that, that it's the audience that decides and you need to persuade her or him. Thank you, Kerry. Now, Mr. Kapoor, perhaps turning to you again, you've had obviously a lot of experience, uh, you know, both in terms of, of litigation and arbitration, and perhaps looking back, uh, you know, many years as, as a young lawyer, what would you say was your sort of, you know, first mistake that you made before court or tribunal, and how would you sort of say that could have been avoided, you know, t to those younger lawyers in the room? Well, I'm not going to admit to any mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would, of course, say that... Uh, owing to inexperience, there were problems. There were problems of uh, how to address the court. There was a problem about the etiquette that you must have while addressing the court. Uh, so these are the basic general problems that one had, but I, I can't say that I made mistakes other than uh, maybe sometimes arguing the wrong side's case. <laughs> no. All right, now moving to, and again, Gary, you touched on this, which is, you know, the, the aspect of listening, and I, and I think I couldn't agree with you more. Now, 
that often becomes a challenge, and again, perhaps you know, through lack of experience as well. Now, sitting uh, as an arbitrator, uh, you would have seen sometimes you, you express a view, you express a concern, and if that's not picked up by counsel, so what would your advice be? Perhaps, Mr. Salve, you know, as, as an advocate, how do you sort of read the tribunal, you know, decide whether they're with you, they're not against, you know, they're not with you? How do you manage See, that? See, the, the, I think, uh, picking up the point where Gary left it off, what my guru, Mr. Palkewala, who's a very fine public speaker and possibly one of the best advocates India has ever produced. The first thing he explained to me is your job is not to say your piece. Your job is to sell an idea to the judge. Now, if you do that by keeping your mouth shut, do that. <laughs> so, first of all, you don't start with the premise that a tribunal must hear all that I have to say, and if it doesn't, the tribunal is not fair. Secondly, please remember, judges, surprising as lawyers may find this, judges think, and <laughs> when they think, they ask questions. And if you, if you want to sing your song and go away with the tune, the judge is not in tune with your tune, you're wasting your time and you're wasting the tribunal's time and you're putting your client in peril. So always remember, you're there to convince somebody. You have to hear what that person is asking. You have to follow where that person is going, whether by the look in his eye, the shrug of his shoulders, or if the person articulates a question, that's the best form. Because what you have to say is something which will convince that person. Until you know what is going on in that person's head, there is no way you can convince that person. So always remember, advocacy is not about saying your piece. Advocacy is about saying what is necessary to persuade a judge, and no two judges are the same. So when, a, when you prepare a case, keep your preparation flexible enough so that when you read the body language of the tribunal, you can alter your line of attack accordingly. Thank you. And Toby, you had a comment. Just to, just to continue the same theme, I think an important realization is who is the actual audience? And a, a mistake that people frequently make is that they treat the audience as their opponent. You can get very focused on your opponent. It is traditional to demonize your opponent. And you will start to bash them, and you'll be aggravated by them and provoked, and you'll make your piece to say all the reasons why they're wrong. But of course, that isn't the audience. The audience is the tribunal. So if you start to do that, the mistake is you will start to argue the case on their territory. And that might actually be irrelevant for the tribunal. Another equal error is to think that the audience is your client, because your client may need a catharsis. They may want you to tell the tribunal everything that's in their hearts, to pour out everything. And they want you to be macho, and they want you to be a strong fighter, and, and they want their day in court or arbitration. And again, that's the wrong audience, because that, again, may not help the tribunal. So it's a question of focusing on who you are actually speaking to. And my own sense is that you should spend more time normally on your own case than your opponent's case. Uh, I was taught that, um, that you can spend most of your preparation actually making sure that your case works. And, and part of the preparation obviously has to be to answer what's being said against you. But the mistake is to be led too much into that. May I just add one, one, ex one, one um, incident in my life, um, which was interesting. It says, I was asked to go to a court in Udaipur. It was a district court. And when I entered the courtroom, it was a Sikh gentleman who was the judge. So I assumed that he was good at Punjabi. So, during arg arguments, I would break into Punjabi, and it went on for some time. After that, he looked at me and he said, excuse me, I just want to say one thing. This was all spoken in Hindi. I want to say one thing to you. I said, yes, I'm sorry. He said, you know, although I am a Sikh, I don't know a word of Punjabi, <laughs> because I am born and brought up in Rajasthan. So there, you know, these are, these are the kind of mistakes that so we, uh, my, uh, Toby and uh, Mr. Salve have rightly said, you have to <laughs> address your audience, and the audience is the judge, and you must know about the judge. What are those words? Sorry? What are those 
What are the Punjabi words? Well, I can't remember the merits of the case, but it has to do with the case. Yeah. Thank you. Now, now, Sikh, I think picking up on a point that sort of Toby made, which is, uh, you know, focusing in your case and, and your opponent's case. But sometimes, I mean, try as we might, you know, despite the best will in the world, the best research, you've got a bad case. So how do you manage that? I mean, how do you manage a weak case before, you know, a high-powered tribunal? manage it to just lose it if it's a high part <laughs> but yeah I mean you have to find um, and as I think what Toby and, and uh, Harish said uh, you have to feel the pulse of the tribunal first and there are always I think I've, at least usually in my practice I've found that you can always find a way through most cases there will be some die hard cases which you just can't win but in most cases um, you'll be able to find a way through and if not, at least give it a good shot that you have a chance of succeeding. Um, if, although when you started, you, had act, you knew and you probably told your client earlier that you should settle, there's no, no case that you have. So if you just feel the pulse of the tribunal, I think you can get to where you want to be at least. All right. Now, Gary, sort of back to you and drawing from that experience as both counsel and arbitrator, uh, you've sat on a number of tribunals and, and sometimes we've all come across uh, what is the clearly biased arbitrator? An arbitrator who's before set, stepping into the room made up his mind, um, decided either in way of, you know, by way of the party that's appointed him or in a particular way. How do you manage that? And perhaps, you know, going into, from the council's perspective as well as sitting on a tribunal because some, some younger audience may actually be arbitrators as well. It, it depends, of course, on, on who the, the clearly biased arbitrator is, whether it's a co-arbitrator or a presiding arbitrator. If it's a co-arbitrator, perhaps one treats it as a blessing. Um, it provides a voice on the tribunal that one can speak to and um, in all likelihood have an impact with the chairman. Uh, if it is the presiding arbitrator who's clearly biased against your party, um, you probably talk to your client about settlement. Um, <laughs> which may also be the case if you have a, a weak case. Sometimes, though, one has to be careful. We've, we've all said that um, one of the most important aspects of advocacy is, is listening, but sometimes one's impressions are wrong. Sometimes one takes a presiding arbitrator or even a co-arbitrator to be biased against you, but they're playing devil's advocate or something of the sort. I think it's always important to, to maintain confidence in your case and to present that case as robustly as you can, not dispirited at the outset because the indications look bleak. The wise words, thank you. I, I just want to share an interesting story with you. I was sitting on a tribunal, Mr. Mukhopadhyay knows about this, as one of the three. We had a f former Chief Justice chairing the tribunal and the judge. And one of the lawyer, uh, lawyers, one of the sides, he was not as articulate as possibly we wanted him to be. And the problem was both the Indian judges wouldn't ask him questions, so they would ask me to ask the question. The transcript showed Mr. Salve constantly interrupting. <laughs> and an application was filed by client before the ICC to remove me for bias. <laughs> so of course, was thrown out. And I think they must have been pleasantly surprised I wrote an award in their favor. <laughs> Thank you. Now, now moving, moving to, to sort of the, the next exciting topic, which is cross-examination. And again, I think that's close to many of our hearts. Uh, both in litigation and arbitration, it's, it's a key aspect of, of the hearing that I think many of us relish to, to get involved in. Now, again, the common complaint uh, by many young lawyers is cross-examination is often left to lead counsel, right? And because in a high-stakes game, uh, very often clients are not willing to take you know, the risk that, that you get a junior lawyer to cross-examine. So perhaps from, from uh, the, tribe, you know, the panel here, uh, what are some of wise words that you can offer to younger lawyers on how they can get more cross-examination experience and actually get into the forefront of that at you know, an early stage of their careers? Toby? I, I think it's very, very difficult to generalize because there are different ways of doing it in different systems. I mean, certainly in, at the London bar, we are from, from, from the start thrown in the deep end um, on small cases uh, in the regions um, to, to cut your teeth for, for cross-examining. Um, we have a, um, and we have the ability uh, to use, for example, small maritime arbitration as a training ground. Uh, there's quite a lot of maritime arbitration that happens in London, 
and uh, and the it's always said that the, uh, in your first year or so you must have the experience of cross-examining the generic Greek ship owner, <coughs> who we, we in a very politically incorrect way we term uh, in, as a generic term Costas unscrupulos. <laughs> Uh, who is likely not to be telling the truth all the time, and that's a great training ground. Now, that's not always available in all other jurisdictions to do that. Uh, so it's difficult to give a, a, an answer. I'm, I am very keen in cases that uh, I argue to have junior lawyers take on witnesses uh, that are peripheral but still have a witness statement, and I'm very keen not to, for there not to be one voice and to share things out. So many hearings, there are uh, junior counsel who will be along with me who will, who will, who will cross-examine uh, a witness where it, perhaps it doesn't matter so much. Um, but I'm not sure I've got any magic answer, I'm afraid. Siku, what about the sort of Indian context? I mean, is, is, is that is the picture different? No, I think it's exactly the same. And I think the same problem that, uh, and I think the way to do it is exactly what Toby said, is to let the junior counsels cross-examine the, uh, you know, the, the fringe wit witnesses where you know that it's not really going to turn the case if something happens in that cross-examination. And I've often done that. I've often asked, uh, you know, people briefing me, and even when I was not a uh, senior counsel, uh, you know, my juniors in the firm, that you should take up some part of the, whether it's cross-examination, maybe a discrete point, get to argue that yourself so that you, you know, you know how, how, um, how to develop yourself as an arguing counsel. Mr. Kapoor, any other words in the Indian context? Well, I think, um, both of these, uh, Toby and Shiko, have made a point, and uh, you really can't generalize this either. But um, one one of the obstacles that stands in the way of uh, uh, giving junior counsels opportunity to cross-examine is being able to convince your client to let them do that. The client obviously has to be consulted, and uh, there are sometimes witnesses who. Are uh, pr probably those who are just simply producing a document or something where it, they're not significant witnesses, where it will be easy to convince a client to let the, let the junior counsel cross-examine. But quite honestly, in the arbitrations that I have participated in, either as an arbitrator or as a counsel, I have uh, not seen this happen, I, to my regret. There's one, one uh, tip I want to share with younger colleagues. When you want to train yourself in, in the Indian context, something like what Toby said, no case is too small. A chance to argue a case is what matters. What's the privilege we had? They, we had a huge backup of appeals in the Supreme Court. There was a time in 1950 when our constitution was framed. I think 5,000 rupees was the limit. Any, any case involving disputes more than 5,000, you had appeal is of right to the Supreme Court. By the time we joined the bar in 78, there were a few thousand of such appeals pending, and by 78 rupees, 5,000 meant nothing. So we had clients like that, and many times you didn't even get a fee, but you got a chance to argue a case. So the solicitor would say, I'll try and get you some 500 rupee fee. Would you want to argue this case? And he said, yeah, forget the 500. We'll argue the case. So that's important. Take on the small arbitrations. Take, nobody is going to, no client is going to agree that in a $500 million arbitration, you do a bit of the import cross-examination. It's not going to happen. Look out for those small little cases where somebody has 100,000 or 200,000 or 500,000 rupees at stake, where he's willing to trust you. And fortunately for Indian juniors, Indian silks have become so damn expensive that even in a mid-sized case, the client can't afford them. So that's your chance. No case is too small. Don't ever think you're going to start by cutting your teeth in multi-million dollar cases. It doesn't work that way. Thank you. <laughs> Very well said. Now, Gary, sort of moving to a slightly different topic. Um, again, in international arbitration, we don't always get uh, parties of the same nationality, of the same cultural background, of the same language. Uh, now, how do you see that as a challenge in cross-examination? If you know, you're a counsel who's trained in English and one other language, and you're dealing with a witness who speaks a completely different language, not proficient in English. How do you see that impacting uh, you know, cross-examination? Well, it begins, of course, with the assumption, which I think many of us in this room would probably make, that the language of the arbitration would be English. Um, they, they say the most widely spoken language in the world is bad English. Um, but 
in many arbitrations, of course, it's a different language. Um, and uh, we, we face special challenges there. One of the most difficult aspects of cross-examination, whether in English or a different language, is interpreters. Trying to cross a witness through an interpreter, whether concurrent or consecutive, um, simultaneous or consecutive um, interpretation is extraordinarily difficult, both because of difficulties in translation, because of the time it gives the, the witness to think about answers and the like. I think many of the lessons that apply, even apart from language difficulties, though, also apply when you have translations or a witness who speaks English or the language of the arbitration poorly. Um, be clear, be concise, speak slowly, pronounce clearly. Um, but even then, often resort to live note to call the witness back to your question is usually what one has to do. Thank you, Gary. And that's a good point you made, live note, which is my next sort of small topic before I round up, which is technology and, and the use of technology in international arbitration. Now, again, um, many of us who have practiced uh, out of India, uh, you know, in Singapore, London, Hong Kong, uh, would have seen that it's almost a common feature or a default in, in many international arbitrations that you have live note, or as Mr. Salve said, the transcripts. Uh, now, we do appreciate that's probably still, you know, not the practice in most uh, Indian arbitrations. So, Toby, could you, could you say, I mean, from both perspective of arbitrator and counsel, is that something you would insist upon almost as a matter of default? Um, and then, Mr. Salve, perhaps you could tell us about how we think we can sort of improve that in India. So, <clears throat> it's difficult to insist on it because it's extremely expensive and it's not always available. Uh, so, I, I don't think it's a question of insisting. If, it's a, if it is available, it is incredibly helpful. Um, it's helpful as uh, an arbitrator just to follow things. It means you can nod off for a bit and then catch up. Not speaking for myself. The, uh, it's very useful as counsel. It's incredibly useful during cross-examination. That's the main thing. I, mean, I, I think it's, it's, less, it's less needed when it's just straightforward submissions. But for cross-examination, to be able to actually see the question and see the answer, to be able to repeat the question if needed, to be able to analyze an answer as it comes up and make the point that it hasn't answered the question. Um, it's it, it very, very useful for counsel, very, very useful for the tribunal. Toby, just to, uh, if I may, just yes, Siku, please. Toby mentioned about uh, um, the you know, cost being expensive, but in the Indian scenario, what I have found is that it actually saves costs, yeah. even if you have to import the, you know, the transcribers from whether it's Dubai or Singapore or Hong Kong. Uh, if you look at the number of hearings that you save, just by using transcription is, is just incredible because otherwise you have our arbitrators going 11 to 1, 2 to 4 sessions for God knows 50 sittings, 60 sittings doing cross-examination of witnesses which you can do in five days if you use transcription. So it saves cost overall for at least for you know large arbitrations in India is just recommended that you should go for it. <laughs> like we say, was there a life before the mobile phone? Was there arbitration before live note was invented? I've forgotten. <laughs> no, it's, it's a, once you get used to it, it's, it's very difficult to work without it. And uh, in the Indian context, as uh, Siku rightly said, increasingly clients have realized the importance of having live note. Otherwise, you have, especially if you have an Indian arbitrator, he goes Indian style, which means he insists on dictating the summary of the evidence. So he is actually saying what the witness should be saying. And that does lead to wrangles many times between the tribunal and counsel saying, no, sorry, that's not what the witness said. And sec one feature apart from uh, arbitrators who nod off, <laughs> we also tell Indian arbitrators that it's very expensive to have these transcribers and we pay them per day. So please set from 9.30 to 5.30, <laughs> not 11 to 3.30. Harish's comment um, reminds me of one of, the, one of the features of arbitration today, and it makes you wonder how you conducted arbitrations without live note. You know, though, when you've been in too many hearings consecutively, when you're at dinner with a friend, you miss what he or she says, and you look down at the table to see what the live note says. <laughs> 
Very, very practical advice. Thank you. Now, again, going to the end of the session very shortly, but I have to ask this question, which is of the you know, learned arbitrators and counsel here, can you perhaps just very quickly tell us what has been your perhaps best um, experience um, as counsel and what has been your worst? So perhaps Siku. That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't on the list, so this is going to put you guys on the spot. That's not easy. Yeah, it's, it's a, I think it's easier to say what's the worst, I guess. Well, yeah, what's the worst then? Um, well, when you know you have a good case and you actually lose it, so that's when you think that you know something went wrong somewhere and um, you feel really bad about it and that's when you, it really hurts. That you, you know that it, it was a winning case, you know that you did your best, you know you had everything there but somehow the tribunal didn't buy it. That's the worst of it. Mr. Kapoor, besides the Punjabi judge, um, do, we, do we have? <laughs> oh, I, <coughs> I really can't say what's been worst or best, but yes, I agree with Siku. When you have a good case and you, and you lose it, th that's a bad experience um, and vice versa. To um, answer your question, maybe the easiest thing to say would be my first case was the worst, but the one I argued today was the best. <laughs> So my worst case was one of my first ones, and this was as a junior counsel in a major international arbitration that was heard in Washington, and the instructions that I received was to lose the case. Now, the reason for that was that it was under a political risk insurance policy, and it was to exhaust remedies. So I had to lose the case in a particular way. I was led by Professor Martin Hunter. Martin Hunter was given a particularly bad point to argue in order to lose the case. The chairman of the tribunal was one Johnny Vida. Now, if you know Johnny Vida, you'll, this will explain what then happened. Johnny Vida was sitting with the Attorney General uh, of Trinidad and the uh, World Bank uh, General Counsel. Martin Hunter argues his point, and we're all thinking, just argue it quickly and move on. It's just so embarrassingly bad. He argues the point, Johnny Vida who knows Martin Hunter well, doesn't let him off the hook. So he says to him, Professor Hunter, before you move on, I'm having trouble understanding this point. Could you please repeat it? <laughs> Martin Hunter repeated the point. This time it sounded even worse. <laughs> he then tried to move on. Johnny Vida didn't let him move on. This happened again and again. He said, Professor Hunter, you're going to have to explain this point. How does this work? Professor Hunter tried to explain it again. It was completely inexplicable. Johnny Vida says, Professor Hunter, I'm going to give you the last opportunity. Now, please, can you take us through this point? And what Professor Hunter then did in a moment of inspiration, he said, oh, oh, you mean that point? No, no, that point will be addressed by Mr. Landau. <laughs> and just to complete what actually happened, Johnny Vida caught my eye. I'm told that all blood drained from my face. And he then looked down and started to make some odd imploding noises because he got the giggles. <laughs> he knew exactly what was going on and he couldn't speak. Uh, so he went bright red, he started shaking, and actually what then happened was he had no alternative but to get up and leave the room, <laughs> uh, which took some explaining to the client. But things have got a little better, bit better since. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's the effect of Toby Lando from his young age. <laughs> Mr. Salvi, uh, I want to tell you about what I thought was my worst case. The new 1996 Act had come into place. The ground of challenge was virtually as the section read, public policy which virtually meant no ground of challenge. There was a strong award by three arbitrators, two of whom are judges from the Supreme Court, before whom I have appeared, superb in commercial law, very well written award on liquidated damages. It was straightforward. The damages were specified. They were claimed. The other side ran a case saying you've not proved damages. They said you're talking nonsense. Liquidated damages don't have to be proved. Award in favor. My client, who was a public sector undertaking, comes up in appeal. I was the Solicitor General. I told them you have a hopeless, unstatable case. They said, but we have to go through the motions of filing a petition to Supreme Court lest Somebody say, why didn't you challenge it? I got up, I made the point, the judge three times asked me the same question, can you explain it again? Every time it became worse. 
But to my absolute horror, the third time when the point sounded pathetic, the judge said, I think you have a point. <laughs> <laughs> and he granted leave to appeal. And let me tell you where that led to. The awful judgment of saw pipes and ONGC. <laughs> that was the case. But I didn't argue it at the final hearing. Gary, in the concluding comment, so the, thank you. My best case was also my worst case. The, the ABA arbitration, which you may or may not have seen on, on YouTube, you can see excerpts of it because it was webcast live. And you can also, therefore, check to see whether I'm telling the truth. It was the best case because it was fascinating with an extraordinarily able tribunal, very able opponents, James Crawford, Professor James Crawford, now a, now a judge on the, the ICJ. Um, a, a fascinating set of issues about the territorial boundaries between one part of Sudan and another part of Sudan. And that was the good part. The bad part was that it was a fast track arbitration that happened with, I think, five sets of submissions, um, consecutive submissions, not concurrent submissions, in the space of about 11 months and a six-day hearing in which the tribunal sat extended hours so that it could issue an award um, in time for the referendum that was to be held in, in South Sudan. Um, surviving that ordeal with, with those opponents um, was, I think, one of the worst experiences in my life. Um, the award was, was a, a challenging award. It, it teaches you something, I hadn't learned it yet then, about listening to the, to the tribunal. The, the tribunal, I think, was focused less on, on legal arguments and, and facts than on the bigger political picture. Um, and, and I think reading that award was, was probably also among the worst moments of my life, even though overall the experience was one of the best. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you, I'm sure you'll agree we've learned a lot from this very leading and eminent tribunal. Thank you. And can we please put our hands together in the usual way? Thank you so much. Well, indeed, some invaluable tips shared, and I definitely learned a lot. Last but not the least, I invite Mr. Nish Shetty, Head Litigation and Dispute Resolution, Clifford Chance Asia, to please come and give the vote of thanks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I should have known that uh, gate crashing this particular event and pretending, pretending to be young was going to come with a consequence. Uh, the consequence apparently is me standing between you and drinks, uh, giving a vote of thanks and giving some closing remarks. So I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. Let me start with what Kevin started with, which is really to thank all of you for being here on a Friday evening. The fact that the room is still full at this time on a Friday evening tells me one very important thing, and that is that we're seeing a new dawn in terms of arbitration in India. I think what we are seeing is the growth of what I would call an arbitration bar, and that is something to be celebrated. In terms of this evening's uh, uh, debate, uh, performance before the tribunal and the, the arguments that have been led, I think you are all uh, beneficiaries of eminent practitioners in the arbitration world presenting to you how arbitration should be done. Now, in terms of key takeaways, here are the ones that I scribbled. Right? First of all, how should an advocate present a case? Distinctions were drawn between litigation and arbitration, and I'll leave it to you to decide what those distinctions are in the Indian context, particularly in, in the context of Indian litigation. But certain things resonated with me, and, I'm, and I hope they resonated with you as well. First, some of the habits, perhaps, that uh, are present in, in the litigation context should be forgotten, unlearned. Uh, listen to what the tribunal is saying. Make sure that you understand that and respond accordingly. Um, in terms of how should a tribunal behave to the extent that some of you are sitting as arbitrators, I think what we saw was an, was an excellent display of a tribunal engaging with those that are presenting to them. How does one go about doing that? In what measure? In what tone? 
what is the what is the what is the temperament that one displays all of these are things that we can certainly learn from the other thing that i took away was in terms of the substance the availability of emergency relief, for example, in the context of an arbitration, in the context of the SIAC rules. I know that it's uh, almost habitual in the Indian context to run for injunctions to the court. But here is an alternative that people should get familiar with, an alternative that's contained within the arbitration context, and depending on the rules, in this case the SIAC rules, the availability of that relief within the arbitration context. Again, that is a key takeaway fr from this. Now, the other takeaway that I, I, I jotted down was how important it is to get the arbitration clause correct. Just observe how much of the debate centered around the issues within that clause itself. Should you really be debating that? If you had gotten the clause correct day one, your client, frankly, shouldn't be paying for that debate to take place, and one can then focus on the dispute itself and the issues between the parties. So there is a huge learning in that. Spend the time to look at the arbitration clause itself. And again, I, I recognize that most in the room are recipients of disputes arising from contracts that you may have nothing may have had nothing to do with, but it's still a, a lesson to be learned there. Now, in terms of um, what, what else one can take away from this, I'd like to come back to what I started with. In India, the creation of an arbitration bar, I think, is key, because for the longest time, litigation, I'm sorry, arbitration has been conducted as an extracurricular activity, to some extent. It's done after a full day's uh, uh, hearing in court and done for a few hours at the end of the day. I hope that events like this will encourage you to consider having an arbitration uh, career that is perhaps more of a real activity and not merely an extracurricular one. And for that, I'm sure all of us are grateful for the display that we've seen today from the practitioners that are before you uh, this evening. Finally, it remains for me to say thank you to each and every participant, the council that presented before, the eminent tribunals that we saw, and the tribunals themselves. They've invested their time in all of you, and I think you should bear that in mind. They're all senior practitioners with very busy schedules, but they're here to share their experiences so that all of you in the room can benefit from those experiences. So will you all join me in thanking each and every one of them for investing their time in all of you. And finally, for the uh, fun part, drinks after this. I've been specifically told to invite all of you. And before you do that, a request from the organizers I think you will all agree that this has been a fantastic event. Please do fill in the feedback forms that are there. That's the only way they're going to be able to make these events even better than they already have been. So join me in thanking the organizers once again, and please do fill in the feedback forms.